Good morning. I think we can start uh, the meeting. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, either here or connected virtually, welcome to the 2022 edition of the annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. For those who don't know me, I'm Maurizio Navarra, I'm the coordinator of the Secretariat of the Platform. I would like to spend less than three minutes to say a few words before I give the floor to the platform co-chair, Conrad Ryan of the European Commission. You, you may remember when the Secretariat was moved to IFA, it was January 2020, I was asked to take care of the transition and then later became the official coordinator for the platform Secretariat. It was February 2020. I'm sure this date rings a bell for most of you if not all of you, as starting from March 2020, less than a month after I was assigned to the Secretariat, almost the entire planet started progressively going into lockdown mode for COVID-19. That was more than two years ago. Yes, if you are wondering, this is the first in-person event we organized under the new hosting arrangements of the Secretariat, hybrid event. Thank you. After more than two years of virtual meetings, high-level events, virtual roundtables, board meetings, thematic working groups meetings, today we're meeting for the first time in person. And, you know, we had, in fact, countless discussions and conversations over the last two years and a half, all virtual, which is surely great for efficiency and costs, but uh, surely we're all understanding what we have been missing out during all these virtual uh, times. So you can imagine how happy how delighted I am to welcome all of you today here in Rome for the AGA. So this, it has a big emotional dimension, this meeting for me today. Those who followed our work also know what we have been cooking on food systems for the last two years, since 2020, going to all our food systems related events, the flagship products, the stock ticket report, the white paper, the high level round tables and so on and so forth. Today starts a new chapter where we will be focusing on national pathways, an agenda that is about coordination, harmonization, our work on coordination, coordination towards a food systems transformation has become more relevant now more than ever with the ongoing crisis affecting food value chains and rural communities. So without further ado, let me stop here. I wish all of you two great days of discussions, conversations and deliberations. I'm very happy to give the floor to our platform co-chair, Conrad Ryan of the European Commission for the open remarks. Conrad, the floor is yours. A very warm welcome to all of you to this year's annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Whether you're joining us physically here in Rome or virtually from around the world, your input is strongly needed during this two-day gathering. As we all know, we are living in unprecedented and in fact scary times, in increasing state of emergency. Food systems are shaken by climate change, COVID-19 and war. Prices for wheat and fertilizers have reached new record heights. For each one percentage point increase in food prices, 10 million people are thrown into extreme poverty. Global dependence on just a handful of must produced grains makes food systems vulnerable. The list of challenges is becoming longer and longer. It is therefore absolutely clear that we must transform food systems and we need to diversify food systems including the types of food that is grown in exporting countries and diets. To tackle food systems transformation in these uncertain times of crisis and conflict, the GDBRD is needed now more than ever before, as global donors have a critical leveraging role in catalyzing food systems change. I wish to highlight that the culmination of two years of work in the food systems agenda by the platform resulted in a recently published white paper on food systems transformation. Our flagship publication with the beautiful title, Transforming Food Systems, Directions for Enhancing the Catalytical Role of Donors, offers us a menu of options to transform our food systems, making them more resilient and sustainable. 
as global donors have a critical leveraging role in catalyzing food systems change, the white paper provides seven key action areas for donors to focus their attention and efforts. During this two-day assembly, we have an outstanding, outstanding lineup of speakers. So before I hand over to our moderator, Henry, allow me to thank the platform secretariat for their amazing work in setting up this hybrid assembly, which was certainly not an easy task. And I also wish to thank all speakers for their availability, as well as all participants for joining us. I welcome all, also on behalf of my co-chair Tristan from Australia, and I wish us successful discussions. Let me now introduce our moderator, Henry Bonsu. Henry is an international broadcaster and media consultant. He worked as a broadcaster for BBC, Sky News and others, and he has also moderated several conferences and events at the UN, African Union, uh, Global Fund and others. And he speaks German too, as I learned yesterday. So thank you very much for your attention and Henry, over to you. Vielen Dank, Konrad. Das ist wahr. Ja, ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen, aber ja, ich habe fast die Hälfte meines Deutsches vergessen. Ja, ich war nur Student, als ich Deutsch gelernt habe. Ja, um, it's a long time ago since uh, I learned German. I mean, I know you wouldn't believe it because of my youthful features, but I was a student back in the late 80s when I spent some time at the Goethe Institute in Sonnenstraße in München, eine Weltstadt mit Herz. So, Munich, a world city with a heart, they tell me. But fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for that wonderful uh, introduction, uh, Conrad and Maurizio. Yes, I have moderated a couple of sessions for IFAD uh, before and for the Global Donor Platform, I think most recently in April at the launch of the white paper written, co-written by Jim Woodhill, who's sitting there at the back and, and previously for the Donor Platform's contribution to the Food System Summit back in September, but that was on Zoom. And here we are in three dimensions in glorious Technicolor. But also I'm gonna look directly at the camera because this is a hybrid situation. And I want those of you watching um, on your computers around the world to know that we are zusammen verbunden, as you would say, Conrad, we are connected together. Yes, come on, let's get some energy. And this is, um, although we have some big brains in the room, people of great distinction and great repute we're also a fairly relaxed, informal bunch. So it's time to take off the jacket early. That's right. To show you there are no barriers here. We want to connect. We want to share. We want to leave nobody behind by leaving no good original thinking behind. Are you feeling me? Can I get a witness? Okay, I don't want to go too religious on you. Fantastic. Okay. So... You'll probably know if you received your background briefings, what some of the objectives are. We want to ask a number of questions over the next couple of days. So for example, how can donors ensure that in-country investments align with country priorities and planning frameworks? That's one question. How can they align their global and regional approaches and interventions? Can we create joint initiatives for a critical mass of investment and reduced transaction costs? And how can global and regional initiatives be aligned? But we want to do this in a very engaging way so that we're not going to just leave five or 10 minutes at the end of every session for Q&A. If you have something that you think is highly relevant and needs to be said at that moment, catch our eye either online by using the chat box function or in the traditional way here in this room. And if we can, in a timely and respectful fashion, we will respond. So have a look at the running order. You'll see what we're going to try and do today. We're going to have three keynote setting presentations, which will be delivered from here and also online. Then we will have um, a, uh, an opening panel, then a coffee break. Then we will have some breakout rooms where we're going to try and take on some of the suggestions that have been delivered here in this room. Then we'll, we'll have a nice, hopefully nutritious and sustainable lunch, not too much carbohydrate, 
not too much carne, Mauricio, with too much meat here. Uh, hopefully some good quality, sustainable greens for with the antioxidants that they provide us. And then we will come back to synthesize what we have discussed and hopefully originated in the earlier session. And then finally, before we close the session of day one, we will look at data, the all important subject of data and how we can optimize it so we make good decisions. So let's start us off with a country that is small in landmass by global standards. I mean, I've come from the UK and Ghana. It's the size of Wales, I'm told, but densely populated and has made remarkable strides, especially over the last 28 years when it made news for all the wrong reasons. Rwanda is in the news a lot at the moment because it wants to be a global player, but it wants to have very good, solid food security. It is a beautiful, green, verdant land of a thousand hills. And our first speaker comes from that country. She is the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. She's responsible for agriculture and livestock. She has a background in food genetics as well. And she's going to tell us how Rwanda has responded to the food systems transformation challenge, including the role of national food systems transformation pathways. And she will also speak about how coordinated support from donors and international agencies can best assist countries. She's going to join us online, I believe from the capital Kigali, or as my Rwandan friend, Mr. Gatsana tells me, Henry, it's not Kigali, it's Kigali. Dr. Agnes Kilibata, who used to be the Minister of Agriculture, please, is that right? Is it Kigari, not Kigali? Kigari, fantastic. Your Excellency, Geraldine Mukeshimana, Honorable Minister of Agriculture for the Republic of Rwanda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Please join us virtually. And you can please give her a round of applause. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you so much, moderator. I was, struck, I was struggling to unmute myself, so thank you, uh, organizers, for doing that for me. Uh, uh, dear Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, co-chairs uh, Conrad and uh, Armstrong, dear distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to the annual General Assembly for uh, Global uh, Donor Platform for Rural Development. I have been uh, uh, asked to speak on implementing national pathways for food transformation to accelerate progress toward the SDGs in times of crisis and conflict as uh, it was introduced uh, before. I will try to emphasize the, on the critical importance of national pathways for food system transformation in the face of uh, this emerging uh, global uh, food and energy crisis. The recent conflict in Ukraine has raised concerns about food and energy prices throughout the world. The conflict has disrupted the global supply of several important agricultural commodities and uh, production imports that Ukraine and Russia produce and export in significant quantities such as wheat, gas, fertilizers, and uh, edible oils. This show could not come at a worse time. Our economies and agricultural sectors are still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused supply chain bottlenecks, commodity shortage, and uh, fiscal uh, pressures. Fertilizer prices are reaching record highs, casting a serious shadow on the future robo harvests. 
fuel prices have increased, raising additional concerns about essential services such as transport, transport of commodities and irrigation. And with an edible oil prices are skyrocketing, creating stress among rural households, especially the poorest households who spend most of their income on food. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to offer some reflections on what we are doing in Rwanda to anticipate and mitigate the threat of the global food and price uh, shocks. First of all, Rwanda is keeping its trade relations strong and open. We know that there may be a need for import, uh, for importing foods from our neighbors when national production does not sufficiently meet national consumption needs. Our foreign trade policy is very clear. It builds and strengthen the regional trade in East Africa and beyond for everyone's benefit. This is not the time to be closing borders for food trade. Second, Rwanda is investing in long-term solu solutions to strengthen our resilience to shocks. Our national plan uh, for agricultural transformation recognizes that our future is in highly productive, high value agriculture. We cannot strive on low yielding farming in a fragile agroecologies. Our small scale uh, farmers are being trained to gain the skills they need uh, to be uh, productive, but also to be able to market the crops and livestock for both domestic and export markets. And the Rwandan government is building necessary infrastructures, hard and soft, to create the enabling conditions for our farmers to succeed. But we recognize that this is not enough. We need more than just productive agriculture. We need the food system transformation. Rwanda is at the forefront of the global conversations about food system transformation. We have recently entered into a partnership with the World Economic Forum to set the global and regional secretariats on food action alliance in Rwanda. As we journey toward a sustainable development a set of four in uh, our national uh, transformation strategy, there are opportunities for our country's food system to become a key driver on that journey. This was highly discussed at length in the national consultations that we have conducted in the run-up to, to the United Nations uh, food system summit back in September 2021. We have always taken a food system perspective. At the national level, we are united in our efforts to improve diet quality and nutrition security, enhance livelihood equity, build our environmental resilience, boost agricultural productivity, and advance the infrastructure and financing and invest, investment capacities that are needed uh, to make all the above possible. Rwanda has also made concerted efforts to involve our development partners in contributing to our national visions, goals, strategy, and plans. In both the short and long term, global donors can use their resources to effectively support food system transformation and resilience. However, these resources availed for country must be coordinated. It is very difficult for governments 
to accommodate the individual and competing priorities of individual donors. It can be very difficult for countries to try to fit each donor strategy into the existing policy framework. I believe it must be the opposite. Donors must find their niche within the country existing strategies, policies, and uh, investment plans. In fact, in Rwanda, we coordinate this very closely and we coordinate our partners' support through what we call the Division of Labor Framework, where our different partners have been allocated different sectors where they play significant roles in the development of our country. For instance, in agriculture sector, we heavily rely on our agricultural sector working group platform to coordinate between the government and the development partners and all actors, donors, NGO, research institute, and our own implementing agencies we are all to be present and uh, act, be active in this working group. Quite simply, we cannot afford to be uncoordinated when the, stake, when the stakes are so high for Rwanda. For this reason, I would reiterate a key point about this annual General Assembly. The work of food system transformation is extremely context specific with no one size fits all solutions. National pathways are therefore an essential piece of the food system puzzle and donor coordination should go beyond global hubs with focus on strong harmonization at national and subnational levels. This path, since pathways for change, we need to be nationally developed, cross-sectoral, inclusive, and uh, locally owned. Uh, dear participants, with these remarks, I wanted to thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed for those remarks. And you were allocated a little bit more time than you've used, which is excellent. And it means you've set the tone, I think, for the rest of the meeting. And since you are there and smiling at me with that wonderful, warm, generous Rwandan smile, can I ask you a follow-up then, if that's okay? Um, please tell me what impact the greater coordination of the various partners that Rwanda is working with has had on your attempts to develop your own country specific food systems transformation. Are you seeing, and let me use a metaphor, really positive yields already as a result of this closer alignment? I think, your Excellency, you may be muted again. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, ah, thank yes. you so much for the question. Uh, I think uh, uh, for one that have been uh, implementing uh, the donor coordination for a while. And uh, uh, this coordination has yielded uh, significant uh, uh, benefits for our country. As I mentioned, we have specific uh, partners that are associated with the agriculture sector, and we highly value their contribution, both in terms of ideas, participating in our, our planning, but also implementing. So I think as we see what is happening in various sectors, being in agriculture, energy, infrastructure, structural developments, all of this is happening because we have been able to tell our partners uh, in an open, uh, frank conversations that these are our plans, we want you to fit into this, and we want you to contribute this way. 
So, I mean, what do we see happening, the first development in uh, uh, agriculture, in energy, in infrastructure development, it is happening because we have been able to have frank conversations and uh, have our partners to contribute in a significant way, but in a coordinated way, not scattering uh, uh, limited resources in a very uh, disorganized way. So we see it happening. Thank you. Honorable Minister, thank you very much. You're getting the thumbs up from some of our colleagues uh, around uh, the room. Does anybody here, this is very brief, have a quick supplementary question or something they want to put to the minister? Speak now or forever hold your peace. You're holding your peace. Honorable Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Kigali. So how does the Rwandan example and Rwandan experience fit in with the wider research, what is known uh, at the moment about how we move to a better coordinated way of transforming food systems? Remember the landmark summit that happened uh, during the General Assembly in September last year. Well, I'm delighted to say our second keynote uh, speaker is able to address that. She's well known to, I think, most of you in this room and hopefully are online as well. She is part of the executive management team. She's a convener, indeed, uh, and managing director for research, delivery, and impact. And we were talking about the correct acronym for CGIR. Don't pronounce the A. I think they're going to rebrand quite soon, I think. And I'm delighted to say she joins us here physically in three dimensions in the room. Please welcome Dr. Claudia Sedov. Claudia. And you can be warm with your love here yeah, in the Italian room. Thank you very much indeed. Excellencies and distinguished guests, it is such a great honor to be here with you today in person at this uh, annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. I've been asked to help broadly set the scene today for this session that looks at how we can best support national food systems transformation pathways, how we can enhance donor coordination and effectiveness. Well, I think as we look at the big picture, one thing is very certain. There is now a very clear global consensus that far-reaching and sustainable transformation is needed across food, land, and water systems, and that this is truly essential. This understanding was in fact the trigger for the UN Food System Summit last year, and the fundamental trigger for the CGIR reforms that had begun a few years before. 2021 was really very much a turning point in terms of growing the global recognition of the need to invest in agri-food systems transformation so that they foster human development while at the same time reducing environmental impacts. The Food System Summit outlined that we will need to achieve healthy diets, decent wages for all across food systems, zero hunger, climate adaptation and mitigation, and the preservation of biodiversity and ecosystems all at the same time. We're truly asking a tremendous amount from our food systems. Following closely on the heels of the Food System Summit, COP26 showed as an increasing willingness of the international community to support the generation of solutions that will reorient our food systems, the way that we produce and consume food to help keep global warming below one and a half degrees. And we hope in the upcoming COP27 in Egypt that there will be an even greater focus on agriculture. Johan Rockström once said, there are three Fs for climate change, fuel, food, and footnotes. We've spoken quite a lot in the climate community about fuel. We now need to think about food. And that growing recognition is with us today. And now, thanks to the GDPRD, we have a white paper that provides guidance on how we can better facilitate a coordinated transformation of the food systems. But colleagues, there's really no time to waste. This is a critical moment to catalyze and to coordinate the transformation of our food systems. Climate change compounded by a biodiversity crisis and further shocks such as the pandemic and the Ukraine conflict, as we all know, are posing extremely high risks to our food systems. 
the worst drought in 40 years in the Horn of Africa, food security threatened in Tigray, extreme heat across South Asia. The recent G7 foreign minister's communique underlined the urgent need to address the issue with global food security as a top foreign policy objective. With the potential for imminent famine in some parts of the world, uh, there is truly an immediate response needed, an immediate coordinated aid response. In Somalia alone, 45% of the country is categorized as in crisis, according to the IPC flat platform. Families in the most affected areas do not have enough to eat and are using crisis coping strategies to stave off hunger. But even as we confront these very urgent and immediate crises, we need not lose sight of our longer term goals either. The bigger picture strategic actions that have to underpin a sustainable transformation of our food, land and water systems to build re resilience into against future shocks. So the G7 agricultural ministers communique highlighted that slowing down any of this important medium and long-term work in order to address short-term challenges will have negative consequences in the medium and longer term. So what do we need to do to do all this at once? In the 2020 series 2030 report, it said that donors need to double investments to end hunger. When the report was published, we were already beginning to suffer the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which followed the first rising, rises in hunger that we had seen in decades. The Ukraine conflict was a nightmare that few of us could have predicted or imagined. Shock piled upon shock. Do we need to reassess the multi-billion dollar funding gap identified in the series 2030 report? I think there's no question that these current events demand an even stronger response to mobilize responsible investment, and that this should come from both public and private sources. Business, formal and informal, provide the lion's share of financing of financial flows and job creation in the food sector. Private sector partnerships are an essential piece of the puzzle, fundamental to bridging the gap between innovation and uptake use and impact. The G7 agricultural ministers also spoke to the need for increasing public and private investment in agricultural research and innovation, mobilizing the global agricultural research system. There was a commitment to enhance research collaboration, voluntary knowledge sharing, and to strive to improve the interface between research science and policy. And the statement of action from the Food Systems Summit included recognition that we must also invest in research and innovation. A holistic and inclusive approach to innovation will be a vital enabler of food systems transformation. This means improving collaboration, involving vulnerable groups, creating partnerships and ecosystems, making much better use of the data, as well as incorporating both new and traditional knowledge and technologies. According to the CGIR convened Commission on Sustainable Agricultural Intensification, investing in innovation could over the next 10 years end hunger, significantly cut global emissions and generate more than a trillion dollars in economic returns. But we need to catalyze that investment. The GDP RD has a key role to play in bringing together the main actors that are involved and cl clarifying the complexity of the donor landscape to drive a more efficient and coordinated targeted investment response. This includes support for food systems coalitions, national pathways, um, uh, and other initiatives that have emerged from and since the Food Systems Summit. CGIR is already uh, supporting ministries to draft their national pathways. In Vietnam, for example, our scientists are providing technical support to draft the Food Systems Transformation National Action Plan. Since 2019, we've been working with Ghana, Uganda, Senegal, Kenya, and Zambia on their long-term low emissions and climate resilient development pathways. We're ready to provide additional support, including to the UNFSS Coordination Hub, where scientific capacity and knowledge can be applied to give a solid evidential base for these transformations. 
and to the issue of country focus. The CGIR increasingly emphasizes positioning regions and countries as central dimensions of partnerships and impact, as the source of demand, as Minister Murakishimana was saying, and as the location of co-design and co-delivery. We're also exploring how CGIR can better strengthen capacity and mobilize direct finance for national systems to meaningfully engage contribute and share capacity on our shared research agenda. The GDPRD has a strong and critical role to play in advocating at the level of member states to shape country transformation plans, to help bring us all together, to advocate for greater understanding and investment in food systems research and innovation, to confront an increasing set of urgent challenges while at the same time steadfastly building resilience to future shocks. We cannot fail in this shared endeavor. Thank you. Very much indeed, Claudia. Again, this is very good. Um, on time and on budget, you took only nine of your allocated uh, 10 minutes. A very quick supplementary, which you can answer in 59 seconds to keep with uh, the trend you've set. Um, what is the key frustration that's blocking the good intentions that we're going to discuss here over the next two days and the good work you've been doing thus far with the likes of Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, etc.? What is the key blockage? I think one of the, the, the key frustrations that we see is the inability or the, the, the slowness of taking the research findings, the innovations that have been created, adapting them appropriately to the contexts in which they need to be implemented and ensuring that there can be uptake and impact in the places in which these innovations and these research uh, breakthroughs have been made. There's so much that is known that could be adapted, uptaken and have immediate results. This is the issue. It's the connection mm -hmm. between the research, the innovation, and the uptake, which requires a broader partnership, mm -hmm. requires targeted investment, and requires the sort of coordination that we're really speaking about here today. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Claudia Sadov. So we're going to try over the next two days to find ways of eliminating these blockages using the big brains here in this room and those joining us online. I can see you. Thank you very much for staying with us. Okay, so Claudia, you mentioned the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub and how you and your organization are prepared to support it. And I couldn't see uh, the face of our next speaker because I saw the back of his head, uh, Stefanos Fortiu, who is uh, he's smiling at me. We met a short time ago and he talked about his experiences on the front line. As I won't go into the detail of what you told me, but you have experienced uh, what goes on on the ground. You're a forester by, by training and you are very, very keen and determined to drive forward the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub, which emerged out of the summit uh, last uh, September. And I saw you've been active on social media in recent days and you declared to everybody that the Food Systems Coordination Hub, which took some time to get going, is now up, running, ready, and officially open for business and engagement. So without further ado, let me uh, warmly invite you up onto the stage to talk exactly about how you're going to do this. Please welcome Mr. Stefanos Fortiu, the Director of the United Nations Food Systems Coordination Hub. Thank you very much, Henry, and uh, good morning to everybody. And, and really thank you for inviting me in this uh, event. It's, it's nice to start being in, uh, as you call, 3D uh, live events and not only on the screens. I saw people in this room that I have seen them before in the screen. I had some problems sometimes to recognize them, but it's nice to see them. So what I would like to do in the next seven minutes, Henry, is to try to tell you where we stand with the establishment of the hub. Indeed, we are up and running. and. Um, I want to dispute a little bit your message that it took us some time. I think for the UN way of understanding time, it happened so fast. Because when we had the summit that happened in September, the special envoy coordinating all the follow-up um, between September and, and December, 
the thing that we have the hub up and running with six agencies around the hub supporting us, um, I think in terms of, of you and timing, it's, it's a bit of a miracle. And I have to tell you something else that I really want to thank here all the UN agencies, IFA, WFP, WHO, UNEP, the DCO, that they are supporting the hub because they have gone beyond sometimes their institutional um, leverage, if you want, and they have done really miracles. So what we have done in the first months of the operation of the hub, this is not working. Um, okay, so colleagues, I think let's stop the public, let's stop the presentation. I'll do it without the presentation. So one of the first things was to define the institutional mandate of the hub and what we are going to do. And there's a very central element on this definition of the institutional mandate, which is the hub exists to support countries to implement food system transformations. And we'll do this by using the combined assets of the UN system and what we call ecosystem of support. And everybody is asking, what's this ecosystem of support? So the ecosystem of support are some of these emerging structures like the coalitions, of course, the scientific and research community, the stakeholders that we are trying to find out what are solutions that they have to propose to the national uh, conveners, to the uh, national pathways. Something that we are listening a lot from the conveners is that you have convinced us that we need to focus on a food systems thinking approach. Could you please let us know how we can make this practical? Because talking on a theoretical level about food systems is one thing. Taking this theoretical level and making it work with people that they have to allocate budgets to um, achieve specific governmental objectives, it's another thing. So we try to support the conveners on taking the food systems approach and make it a reality. We started the work of the hub after the definition of our institutional mandate by making a survey with the national conveners. And in the survey, we try to understand what the countries want from the hub in terms of support. And I have to give you three main results of this survey. One was the response rate. You know, in, in the UN system, in the academic community, we are happy when we have a response rate of 30 to 35 percent. We got 86 percent response rate on this survey. And this, for me, is an indication how much the countries want to follow up with their food system transformations. The second is that the countries had extremely specific proposals on what they want to see from the hub. They want to see the hub supporting them to leverage funding and finance. They understand that the hub will not provide the money, but they want to see how the fund, the fund can leverage this, these funds. They want to see practical support on what I said, translate the theoretical food systems thinking on, on something that can go at the country level. And they want to see connections. They want to see connections with the academia, with the food system, uh, eco with the ecosystem of support. And to realize this, we will sit down with the countries and the ecosystem of support and create what we call the food system solution library to be available to the countries. The countries need something else also. And it was amazing to see that they, they want this support for the short term and for the long term. They want support on monitoring and evaluating their food system transformations. And they are looking of the milestone of the 2023 stock taking moment that will happen at December 2023. But at the same time, they are looking at the 2030 agenda and how they are going to use the transformation pathways to implement the agenda. So what the hub is, is doing after we, we have a work plan uh, approved by oversight uh, steering group, which is the heads of the RBA principals, uh, the head of UNEP and DCO and, and with the presence of the Deputy Secretary General. So we have an approved work plan. We have an approved uh, stakeholder engagement uh, group in terms of references. So we are putting together now these groups and we have started working with the coalitions of uh, action on the food system transformations and with other actors of the ecosystem of support to provide the support to the countries. The countries need immediately what uh, some kind of support and they need immediately support to keep the momentum of the food systems, especially in the new crisis 
uh, emerging after the war in Ukraine. And if we don't keep this momentum, we might lost investments that Agnes Kalibata took her two years to produce results. So we need to keep this momentum with some small support to the countries. And on the medium term, we need to prove the value of food system transformations. So I would like to thank you very much for inviting me in this, in this event. I will be very much looking to continue talking to you. And please, um, the, the moment that you would like additional information about the hub, I'll be very much to provide this to uh, your individual organizations, but to your groups. Thank you very much. Stefanos, thank you very much. Again, uh, you are on time and budget. This is this is truly remarkable, almost unheard of, whether in the Italian room or anywhere else. Very quick supplementary, you, you talk about needing to prove the value of this approach. How do you think we prove the value? What will be an obvious indication that there is value in this, that it is working? What would you want to see? I want to see how the countries, when they talk about food system transformations, they think simultaneously about the environment, the society, uh, the economy, and the health. And I think what we, what we can prove is that there's a one difference of doing agricultural development and another thing to do food systems. Mm -hmm. With agricultural development, you might achieve some specific targets. At the same time, you might create some uh, trade-offs. But if you focus on the food systems approach, it's a win-win situation for the people, for the planet, for the economy. Thank you very much, Stefanos, for two. Thank you very much indeed. So we're going to move to our first panel. And those of you watching online, you are fully involved in this. Please do send any thoughts, comments, reactions. We're getting one or two really good and positive and indeed challenging questions coming through already. And I'll put those to our panelists and others who speak uh, later on in the day and, of course, tomorrow. So please keep those questions coming through. And, of course, here in the room, if you want to make an intervention, at the right time, at the right moment, then please uh, do let us know. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to move away from here. I'm going to take my seat in just a moment. But I would like to invite both our in-person and virtual panelists for this next session, which will look at the challenges and opportunities for taking forward national path use. So we're going to, uh, and uh, for food systems transformation. So we're going to move this away and hopefully my mic will continue to work as I move away from the podium. From Yemen, Madam Karima Al Hada, who is Planning and Liaison Specialist at the Scaling Up Nutrition, the Sun Movement, Yemen Secretariat. And she's also with the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation in that country. And also joining us via Zoom, uh, I can see uh, Madam Karima Al Hada. Hello to you. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Yes, the mag yes, the camera's moved and uh, you're looking at me. Fantastic, wonderful. I love hybrids, don't you? Don't you love hybrids? Okay, and then we also have Excellency Dr. Sok Silo, who is the Secretary General for the Council of Agricultural and Rural Development, CARD, from the Republic of Cambodia. And um, uh, Dr. Sok Silo will be joining us from Cambodia. Wonderful, now that the, uh, the plinth has been removed, here in the room, we have Mr. Yiri Olila, coordinator for the Food System Summit, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry from Finland. Please do come forward. Please be nice and welcome, Mr. Olila. Our other speakers, Dr. Johan Swinnen, uh, the Global Director of Systems Transformation at CGIR, Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, also known as free and co-chair of the Think20 Task Force on Food Security. Dr. Swinnen. Yes. We have Dr. Agnes Kalibata. She's been mentioned once or twice this morning, president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, a former United Nations Special Envoy on the Food Systems Summit. Please, Dr. Kalibata, please come forward. And we also have Mr. Ayodeji Balogun, 
Chief Executive Officer of Afex Commodities Exchange. Mr. Balogun, please come forward. Uh, there you are, sir. Excellent. So just to remind you, we're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities for taking forward national pathways for food systems transformation. The way this is going to work is we're going to hear from our country conveners, first of all. We're going to put one or two key questions to them. Once we've heard from them, we'll then hear from our research speakers to our uh, president of AGRA and also from our um, AFEX chief executive officer looking at the private sector response to that. So we're going to cover several bases. And then we'll also try to feed in your questions and your thoughts both online and here in the room. But so it's really going to be a, very interesting to get the perspectives of three very different uh, countries, which are all in the news for a variety of reasons at the moment. One in the news because it's under great pressure um, in, let me describe it, in a very, very troubled neighborhood um, in the Saudi Peninsula. Uh, one, um, a country in um, East Asia, which has some challenges with agriculture and rural development. And one from a high income country uh, that has a long border with a difficult neighbor, if I can put it that way, uh, that is making news for a variety of geopolitical reasons as well. So all, all three are. And then we've got a lot of um, research uh, and uh, driving experience from our three other speakers. So we'll hear from them after we've heard from our country speakers. So let us start off with uh, Yemen and to Madame Karima al Hada. Ah, not yet. Oh. Fantastic. Okay, so we will pick up with Karima in just a moment or two. But Excellency Dr. Soxilo, there you can give us a wave. I can see you. I want some response, please. Live response from you. Fantastic. Okay, the, yeah, good, good, good. You see, it's working. This is not uh, some recorded thing. This is, this is real. Good. So Dr. Silo, please tell us, so from your experience in Cambodia, what are the greatest challenges and opportunities in taking forward the food systems transformation pathways in your country. Dr. Soxilo, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Henry, and thank you for the organizer for inviting me to the 2022 uh, Annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Yes, good afternoon from Cambodia. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say uh, the challenge and opportunity for Cambodia for taking forward uh, the national food system transformation pathway. First, we need to understand the big picture for food system and knowing how to use them. The current understanding on food system is limited and this challenges us in arguing the care for investment tailored to system improvement. In addition, coordination and collaboration are still limited. The matching opportunity is for the national pathways to be used as the guide for the transformation of the food system in Cambodia and ends to business as usual. Second, too many financial model and management system is in due, especially among the development partner. And there is a lack of interoperability among this system. The opportunity lies in matching financing model with the national roadmap for food system and related plan for a more uh, unified and harmonized approach to financing. There is opportunity both to optimize the government expenditure and to draw out more constructive investment from the private sector and development partner. Third, uh, insufficient investment in the national statistics and analysis to support information uh, need for decision-making and policy. The monitoring 
and evaluation effort invest in project does not have to build up uniform national capacity. Our opportunity is to rationalize data collection, uh, focus on select indicator and ensure open access to information. Using the SDG and the N4G commitment and national strategic plan to forge a common framework for measuring uh, progress at national and sub-national level. For the coordinate support, Cambodian need donor and international organization to participate in the multi-stakeholder platform at national and sub-national level and provide support for those platforms in both financial, technical, and technological support. We also need to adopt the common system of financing, uh, making greater use of pool funding and streamlined approach, which are fit to national strategy, process, and priority. Finally, we also need to align the support and monitoring framework with global and national target, including the SDG and the strategic development plan under a more coordinated program of investment. We need more help to do that. So, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sok Silo, for giving us the perspective from um, Cambodia. Uh, people were nodding and they were responding with interest to what you had to say about the problems with coordination, lack of a unified approach, especially from development partners and the help you need in particular areas, very specific. So thank you very much. Let's uh, see if we can compare and contrast your experience in Cambodia with the experience from Yemen. I'm delighted to say that Madame Karima al Hada is uh, on the line back with us. So over to you, please. Um, what are the greatest challenges and opportunities in taking forward the food systems transformation pathways in your country? Over to you. Thank you so much and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for inviting Yemen for, uh, to this very important event. Actually in Yemen, the National Food System Dialogues prioritized about uh, seven thematic areas with focus on almost 21 priority actions that take forms of um, national working groups. So the opportunities lie in the operationalizing of these working group to go to the next level where action plans are developed to, to realize the objectives on ground. It is also an opportunity to see these um, pathways as part of this global momentum, which gives them acknowledgement among the stakeholders and actors, as well as the um, possibility to link them to the global initiatives. Actually, the, um, there are many global initiatives, uh, especially that ones uh, providing financial and technical support for, the, um, uh, for development, which can be approached to realize these national pathways. Another um, opportunity lie in the role of the civil society organizations and the business sector and how to introduce the pathways to them, how to educate them about the role and what is um, required from their, um, their side. Um, speaking of challenges, um, actually the, there are, I think, competing pathways for limited resources as well as very limited capacities uh, required to realize these pathways. Um, also, it may sound very interesting that these pathways were developed uh, at national levels by national uh, uh, stakeholders and expertise, but there is a still a need to advocate for them at the national levels to introduce them to the different sectors so they can adapt them and uh, prioritize them within their sectoral action plans. The pathways 
from my point of view, uh, are the shortest uh, way to respond to people's needs and aspirations also. But also there is um, an, a potential of having gaps and duplications. So there, um, I think the prioritization of these national pathways is a must. And it is so important to have a clear framework for the implementation. And here we have this, um, um, the good support of the food system secretariat and the hub. They are there for this um, support. I think also we need to pilot some of these pathways so we understand the, the challenges more and more and we can respond to them uh, in the right way. So challenges, I think, are more relevant to the limited financial resources and also limited uh, capacities within the national system. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam uh, Karima al haddad for the perspective from Yemen. Thank you very much. And now let's uh, hear what is happening in uh, Finland. Uh, Mr. Yiri Olila is on my immediate left. Uh, delighted to see you. So let's uh, compare and contrast what is happening in your country, uh, what food systems transformations are needed in high income countries and, and how uh, is uh, Finland responding? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here uh, um, with, with you uh, in person here and uh, virtually, virtually um, uh, through the um, system. It's nice to see two of the former convener, convener colleagues again. Uh, we had uh, weekly meetings throughout the year in preparations for the, for the, for the summit meeting. Uh, with, the, with the conveners, and that was an extremely useful community created for, for, for the national dialogues. Uh, <clears throat> um, for my country, um, the uh, process of national dialogues uh, uh, and then producing the national pathway document was found very, very useful. That was um, in spite of the fact that uh, in our country we have a, a long tradition of, uh, of stakeholder consultations in all policy preparatory work. Uh, uh, but um, we, it was found that uh, that was a, a, a good way to, to, to identify um, sensibilities and uh, possible weaknesses in our systems. Uh, the pathway document um, is supposed to be a living document uh, to be updated. And that's what we are doing uh, uh, right now. Um, in, uh, in order to be uh, update, update for the uh, government uh, program negotiations uh, one year from now, we have national elections uh, next spring and then uh, a new government program will be negotiated. And uh, uh, our aim from the beginning has been that uh, the national pathway document should not uh, remain a, a sort of one-time effort, a separate uh, paper uh, with wishful thoughts, but should be an integral part of the government program. Uh, uh, in the context of, of sustainable development uh, policies of the government. Um, if I take uh, two or three uh, sort of key words mm -hmm. uh, of, of the results of our discussions and, and, and our pathway um, thinking, I should take first uh, uh, the concept of uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, it, is, uh, it is the sort of survival uh, strategy of all biological processes and organisms. Diversity is if something does not work, there are other ways to go. And um, 
in agricultural production, we should learn from that principle um, to, 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 to uh, um, be diverse, not only in the agricultural production uh, and technologies, but also di diverse in, 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 uh, in the um, sort of input sourcing uh, sources, uh, diverse in, in our marketing systems, diverse in our nutrition, uh, in, 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 in eating habits. Uh, diversity is a survival uh, principle for, for the food systems as well, we found in our discussions. Uh, another um, uh, uh, key word is um, uh, re resilience. We, we found some weaknesses in our resilience, even though we are in a fairly good situation in, in general, we thought to be, um, but we found that we are too much dependent on, 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 on um, sources which we cannot uh, handle ourselves. Uh, along with the war in, 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 in Ukraine, uh, we found that we are um, dangerously uh, uh, dependent on, on, on fertilizer uh, raw materials uh, from Russia and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, Belarus. And that is only one example, but we should be more self-sustaining in our uh, production, um, not only uh, in 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 uh, um, in uh, uh, raw uh, natural resources, uh, but also in 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 energy, uh, in genetic materials, labor, finance, knowledge, everything. Uh, that is not to say that international trade uh, is, is, a, is a source of uh, problems. That is a very comp important complementary uh, 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 element, but uh, we, we found ourselves to be more uh, too much uh, dependent on some of this strategic. Okay, Mr. Uh, Olila, I'm going to stop yeah. you there. Thank right. you very much. And uh, you are building up to almost describing yeah. not quite a code red, right. <laughs> but you talked about um, some real danger dangers mm. in uh, Finland's food resilience, which I, I wasn't expecting. So thank you for being so frank uh, about that. And uh, thanks also to our speakers from uh, Yemen um, uh, and uh, Cambodia. We've got three perspectives. So now let's talk to our other colleagues from uh, research institutions, um, from uh, multilateral uh, bodies, and from, well, the Forex, Forex uh, um, pioneers, if I can put it that way, which is great. So I'm going to go to Dr. Johan Swinnen, first of all. And for those of you who don't know, Johan is uh, sitting on my near far left, um, uh, Global Director of Systems Transformation at CGIR and Director General of the IPRI and co-chair of the Think Tank, uh, sorry, the Think 20 Task Force on Food Security. Uh, let, let, I mentioned Code Red uh, deliberately because you've mentioned that yourself uh, pre in previous remarks. So thinking about what we've heard from our three country representatives, what do you see as uh, the role of national food systems and transformation pathways in helping to bring about the change we want to see? Um, and how can science and policy come together through the pathways? Um, thank you very much for inviting me, for being here. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an, an honor and a challenge to talk uh, before Agnes comes uh, to the podium here because she has been working and thinking about this for uh, for years and that's why you and i put you before agnes i know so uh <laughs> so i want to stay a bit out of her way in terms of uh, my interventions here so let me just in terms of um i think it's important to to I, it's really important, I think, what we did last year in the Food Systems Summit, to put it in a historical perspective, but also how history has changed just in a couple of months. 
Okay, with Ukraine war, uh, this has come, it's kind of almost a triple hit if you want after. We had major changes that, occur that occurred already before COVID-19 uh, with basically worsening food security, increasing malnutrition around the world due to a number of reasons, including economic uh, downfalls, uh, conflicts around the world, which were rising already. And then COVID-19, which made things uh, much worse. And so now with the, uh, the, the Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine war coming on top of it, and Ukraine war, I think, is different from the previous conflict. Although for the, the countries where the conflicts are taking place, that's probably the most important reason for their food security problems. But it's, the Ukraine war is different because it affects global markets, not just in food, but in fertilizer and oil. Each of these three have major implications for countries around the world in food security issues. Now, how does it affect the transformation and the national transformation strategy? I think there's a couple of very important implications. One is that if you look now over the past 20 years, okay, when we talked, when we looked at the shock in 2007, 2008, the price shock, we saw this is a shock, okay, because this is abnormal. When you look over the past 20 years, I mean, it's volatility. That's the norm, okay? So big price jumps are no longer an exception. They are the rule, which means that our transformation strategy globally and nationally has to take that very much front and center, okay? Resilience has to be, Crucial, uh, a crucial component of that. Now, what's good about it, if you look at the white uh, book, which you have, or the white paper, which was being prepared, I think it's an excellent document. The seven action areas there are really very consistent, I think, which has to take place even in today's, or also in today's world, um, environment, et cetera. So the catalyzing changes there. So that's the good news. Okay, the bad news, I think, is also during crisis, you see that countries are reverting, if you want, to non-cooperative actions uh, in a number of cases. Both one example is what's happening in food exporting countries, where again, just like in 2008, again, let I, uh, at the beginning of COVID, they revert to export constraints. I mean, very important uh, restrictions on exporting various types of foods uh, around the world. And this, of course, has all kinds of implications. We were rather we were unsuccessful in 2008 of reverting that. We were much more successful in uh, 2020 after the early early months of COVID on reverting these policies. At this point, we are not okay. I mean, there's there's even more export constraints being implemented rather than less. So we have to move away from this non-cooperative behavior. The second one is that you see in a number of rich countries where there have been, um, for example, in the EU, the US a number of strategic choices had been made in the past years of moving towards more sustainable food, food systems, that some of these policies, agro-environmental policies, are reversed, okay, making things worse again. And so that's very troubling, I think. So the political economy, the political incentives there, I think are really uh, in, very important factors to take into account when we think about these, these national strategies uh, across the world. There are, I can go through a number of, of points in terms of, I think, how what we see now in terms of policies that need to be implemented are fully consistent with the transformation strategy that has to do, for example, with food safety um, uh, systems, okay, which were implemented and expanded during COVID, which was good, which we need to expand. And there, uh, I think that's also happening in the world. The problem there is where does the money come from? I think therefore clearly donor co collaboration and the types of things we talk about today are a really important element there. Same thing, information systems are crucial. We knew that before, also in terms of crisis people, in terms of being resilient, you need to know what's coming, how to prepare for it, anticipate. Uh, it's one of the um, areas which are emphasized in the white paper. And then uh, I think research and development, Claudia made a very strong pitch, very um, strong arguments why that is important, both for the short run, the medium run, and the long term. So I'm, I'm not going to repeat her argument just to say that it, I thought this was very powerful. And we have in the CGIR, we have a, develop, a number of notes and, and documents on this. I'm happy to, to go into detail on that. And let me end then by again emphasizing these political commitments, which I think is crucial. And there, I think the, the cooperation system, the institutional system we build globally can play a very important role. Let me end with that. Dr. Swinnon, thank you very much. And uh, Johan, you can uh, develop some of these thoughts in more detail in the breakout sessions. That's what they are for, where you can dive into the granular uh, detail of, of some of the uh, ideas, some of the thoughts that we don't have time to develop in great detail in this session that will come 
in the session to come after this one. Uh, fantastic. Well, uh, you did worry about speaking before Dr. Agnes Kalibata. You did so uh, with aplomb, which is fine. Okay, so now we have the president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And of course, as you all know, the former UN Special Envoy on the Food Systems Summit, Dr. Agnes Kalibata. So Agnes, just uh, thinking about um, the National Food Systems Transformation Pathways, of course, a key plank in the summit and an important part of your uh, agenda at AGRA, the future agenda. So what will lead to these pathways succeeding or failing in bringing about the scale of change needed? Because we've heard from everybody, we need essentially a revolution, as you would say. Please, your thoughts. Thank you. Um, so this is on, okay. Yes. But yes. thank you, and thank you, um, uh, Johan, for for kicking us off the right way. Listen, um, there are quite a number of things that we need to do, but what we've already done is probably one of the most important things, the fact that we have come together as a community and agreed that our food systems need to transform. Yeah. I mean, we saw that uh, during the summit, the, the, the level of agreement was unbelievable. Now we need more protection. So, and which is my, I would say, I really love the action part of, of, of the zone of the environment you work in. But there are a number of things that people have talked about here that we must address. The challenge of coordination, which is an extremely important challenge for something that is as complicated as a food system, because we have several sectors concerned. The challenge of fragmentation, which is something that is very common in how resources so the challenge of fragmentation, uh, given uh, now uh, what we see on the ground from a resource perspective, there are just so many resources that are cut in so many small pieces that end up not being extremely transformative. And then the challenge of partnerships, which is the, the reverse side, the opportunity side, on, on the challenge of fragmentation. So one of the things we've done that I would like to just show you here on the slides as Agra, we asked ourselves the question of where do we go from here from a food system perspective? Because food system is the place where we had the biggest commitment from heads of state. So maybe if you, no, no, the next slide. On this slide, I show you three things that we think are extremely important. The food system uh, pathway that a country puts forward is an intention. It's a commitment by head of state, but it needs to come to real life. And the way we bring it to real, real life is talk about designing national strategies that can actually bring it to life. What is it in the agricultural sector that is still a gap? What is it in the environmental sector that is extremely important and touches us in the agricultural sector? What is it in the health sector that we are paying for, that we shouldn't be paying for? In the Food System Summit, we brought out this whole idea of um, the true cost of food, which true cost is really in the environment and in the, in, the, in the health sector, because we pay for these things, right, in those sectors, and we don't think about it, but the environment is paying and people are paying. Mm -hmm. So we do design those strategies and want to bring out that design at country level, and we are already doing it with some of these countries. And once these are agreed on, we need to agree on coordination. I just talked about three sectors there, but there are many more sectors that touch the agricultural sector, and I'm sure every... Uh, uh, every convener that is here does understand what that means. We need to, to raise it a little bit beyond sectoral coordination and take it higher. And my colleague here from DRC knows that. She, she, she sits in the president's office and DRC is coordinating at that level, which is extremely important to bring these sectors together. And then of course, we need to agree on accountability. I keep telling uh, Stefanos that next year, if we can't come to the FH FHLP, is it FHLP? HL, whatever, the, the heads of state meeting in New York. If we can't come to that meeting talking about this is what the food system has done in terms of transformation, then we are really off track, completely mm. off track. So here, what we are trying to say is we have a few countries by September that will have clear strategies that will be looking for opportunities to move forward, that will be looking for investment investments for private sector, and I'm saying it to my friend here from Arfix is here. So we are looking at what areas would the private sector be investing in, but what areas would the public sector be investing in? Because transformation of food systems is about the two. 
in the public sector and the private sector investing together at the same time. Now, when I went to the Food Systems Summit, my biggest concern was the African continent would not engage. The African continent has been heavily engaged. We have 49 countries that have submitted pathways, I mean, that have participated, and we have over 37 countries that have, have submitted pathways. So what, we, what is really, really important that Africa brings on the table that other people need to learn from is we have actually frameworks. We have the CADAP framework, whatever it has delivered or not delivered, but actually we saw significant movement in the agriculture sector because of the CADAP framework when st countries started investing more. We want to use that framework to ensure that national pathways can actually indicate us, actually embedded and attract at heads of state level. That commitment we have already secured from African Union. Now, what, the reason I had NEPAD on there is because NEPAD has committed to actually provide a framework that will guide countries so that we don't start running around trying, doing all sorts of things. A framework that actually can help guide countries. These are the guidelines of how you develop your, your national pathway. And this is what your national path, pathway looks like. We'd like to work with the FAO Investment Center to make sure that when a country has developed its um, national pathway, I mean, national strategy and flagships that actually FAO Investment Center can say, okay, these actually look real to us. They look ready. They address most of the challenges that uh, institutions like IFPRI have identified as the critical gaps in, in these countries. So there's an opportunity for all sorts of institutions to work together and bring this to life at country level. But the only way we can deliver it is if we coordinate right, if we respect country and where countries are at, many of the, the conveners have said it, and if we coordinate right at country level, several sectors, the next slide just shows you a, a simple thing. Next slide, this one, just shows you how so many, this is one country that we're doing an analysis for, how these things are coming together at the center. If you don't have a high enough level, like my colleague here from, from DRC, it's going to be very difficult to coordinate sectors when you're coming from within another sector outside. So um, we, uh, we are already working on this. We are welcome to participate in the AGRF 5 to, 5 to 9 September, where we'll be discussing where countries will be presenting this to, to interested partners and interested donors. We are really interested in providing a blueprint that can be used by anybody, everybody, anywhere, just as long as we get moving. So the next year, we have something to report against. Hopefully next year we can have many more countries joining. Yeah, and we are providing, in Africa, I work in Africa, by the way. Yes. In Africa, we are ready to, to work with any country that is interested in advancing this further. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for that. I love the idea of a blueprint that's going to kind of mobilize from theory to real action yeah. and the accountability, as mm -hmm. we said to Dr. Otiu, that when you go to UNGA uh, 2023 and then 2024, if you cannot tell these heads of state, this is what we've done, yeah. then we off track. So great for the accountability. You also set up perfectly, as we say in radio, segue to the private sector. And I can see uh, Mr. Ayodeji Balogon, he was shifting around nervously when you mentioned private sector. I worked with he, him in the You know him, yeah. so he's so comfortable, he's comfortable. He's very comfortable. Okay, very good, <laughs> thank you. For, for, yeah, he's comfortable, so everybody on Zoom be reassured. There's nothing gonna happen to him here. So um, let's talk about, um, you as a private sector person working in the foreign, foreign exchange business, um, food production and distribution, a lot of people aren't really aware, but it's largely a private sector activity. So having listened to our country representatives and our research uh, representatives here and our revolutionaries, uh, what is needed to bring businesses into the work of the national transformational or transformation pathways and how best can business contribute as far as you're concerned? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a huge honor to be, to be here today and sharing our experience. So um, I want to share two stories uh, very quickly and then one message um, in terms of how we from the private sector think and how we think, um, you know, you from the donor should actually look at, um, you know, your, your participation and your contribution um, in the food systems. So the first is the story of um, IFAD. Um, and a baby that was birthed out of IFAD about four years ago called SAFIN. SAFIN is Small Older Agri Finance and Investment Network. And it looks at a network of all the um, players that catalyze investments in agriculture. So donor agencies, private investors, uh, uh, businesses acting you know, to unlock finance 
banks and the likes um, across the globe. And probably is the only um, agency squarely focused on agriculture financing, agri SME financing, particularly um, um, on the globe. Now, um, uh, when this, when surfing, when surfing started, uh, one of the first, and I am the chair of surfing, so uh, I've been the chair since the beginning of surfing. Um, so when we surfing started, one of the first things we did uh, uh, with the secretariat, which is housing IFAD, was to do an investor perspective. So look at the country, look at the value chains, um, do an analytics of the value chain and investment opportunities. So that we can then you know, articulate some of the opportunities um, that private uh, public investors could then pick up and invest in. Um, I, and that was done in Uganda, done in Nigeria, done in India, and one other country, Dominican Republic, I think, um, uh, where the countries where we did this. Now, uh, when they did in Nigeria, as a business, we, we looked at a few value chains were of focus. Um, what popped out to us as a private investor, now speaking at IFEX, uh, which is Africa Exchange Holdings, and we set up commodities exchanges across Africa. Um, what, 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 what came out to us was a key component, a cross-continent theme, rather than the value chain investment opportunities, uh, which was the delivery mechanism of the food systems. Um, and it was tabbed in that report, I agree, um, agri service providers. Um, and, you know, even in a, in a similar report work that Agra had done, um, you know, which I always refer to and says the hidden middle in the food systems. Those agri SMEs uh, that actually deliver, connect the farmer to the markets and connect the input systems to the farmers. Um, you know, the, th those are the actual catalysts, the engine of delivery for our food systems, but very hidden and very often uh, forgotten. Um, so the agri-service provider as a model jumped to us. And the way I thought about it was think about why do we have McDonald's in almost every corner of, you know, United States and increasing the world because of the franchise system. Uh, so for us, we started to think about what we had built. At the time, we had about um, 40 to 50 warehouses in Apex that were connecting to about, you know, 150,000 farmers at the time and um, provided market access and access to finance for them. And we said, how can we use this agri service provider model as a franchise model to amplify our scale? How can we take um, the agro dealers in the village and make him a business partner, um, working with him in the branding, provide technology to him, provide working capital to him, and then he runs that same model in a simplified manner to deliver service to the farmer. So we picked up that model, did a second, uh, co-founded a second work uh, with Safi, uh, and Lagos Business School Center for Sustainability um, to then sort of hash this out into a business model that we could build on. Interestingly, we started the commercialization of that plan last year. Um, uh, we worked with 15 agri-service providers, uh, provided through that channel alone about $2 million in loans to about 10,000 farmers. Uh, this year uh, is the second year running for that sort of track for us in terms of franchising. And we're working with 50 agri-service providers providing about $10 million in loans to 40,000 smallholder farmers through that channel. Now, it's, it's become a strategy pillar of our growth driver um, and how we want to think about reaching 600,000 farmers through 3,000 agri SMEs working as a franchise sell to us as Apex. And that's how one of the examples of how, um, you know, spending in knowledge, um, spending in taxonomy, standardizing frameworks in a sector could make it easy for private sector players to pick up an opportunity, identify the innovation, and then make it happen. The second story is uh, a personal one, but one that has uh, uh, President Agnes Kadebata uh, written all over it. So mm. in, in December 2017, precisely, um, sorry, December 2012, uh, December 27, 2012, precisely, I got married. And uh, January 15th, 2013, uh, two weeks after, one week after, my, I was sent to Rwanda by my company um, to set up a commodities exchange. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was one of the projects with um, President Kalibata when she was the Minister of Agriculture in Rwanda. So um, every fortnight I had to go report to her on the progress made uh, because from the point I landed, it was clear that the President, uh, President Kagame, was going to launch the exchange in May 15th. So we had a date for the launch yeah. and I had five months to get everything running, um, including setting up the office, uh, putting in technology, you know, having the warehouse working and all of that. Um, 
So, you know, fast, so we started that. It was an interesting experience. We did have the launch. It wasn't in May, but uh, uh, we make it up when, in, within six months. Um, you know, fast forward that when then she became the president of Agra, um, I went to her and said, you know, we're now in Nigeria doing the same work. I, Rwanda is working. We're now in Nigeria, which is the third country we were operating in, and that uh, we needed help. So we got a million dollars from Agra to sort of help us move from 30,000 farmers uh, they were away in 2018 to 150,000 was, was the hope. So I went back in 2019 and said, uh, our president Kalibata, I've spent 750,000 of the $1 million we got from you. We have the 150,000 farmers now. Uh, we have $250,000 uh, left. Uh, but I want to use this in a different way. Now, today, we understand how to um, reach the farmer, provide market access for the farmer, uh, provide access to finance for the farmer, uh, provide storage, three very big problems around storage, finance, and market access. Um, but then we still have a problem. Um, we, we spend a dollar uh, to earn 60 cents for every transaction. The cost of reaching the farmer is expensive. I have an idea on how to drop this cost and make the business profitable. Um, but for the last four years, I've succeeded in solving the problem, but I've declared losses to my investors. So if I go to tell them to give me money to pay a consultant on how to make this work, they're going to tell me to submit my resignation later. <laughs> so um, I need you to let us use this $250,000 to pay to articulate our new strategy, the way I think that we can frame this business, solve this problem, be scalable, but be profitable as well. She agreed. Um, so we did work you know, with a consulting firm, articulated a strategy. By end of 2019, we presented a new strategy. Uh, by 2020, we were executing on the new strategy. Now, this is the story. Um, last month, um, Financial Times named FX the third fastest growing business, not agribusiness, the third fastest growing business in Africa, the fastest growing um, in Nigeria. Across, faster than the fintechs, uh, we had 270% CAGR, over three years, starting from the point where we had the new strategy. We've been profitable every year um, from that point till now. We've moved from 150,000 farmers to half a million farmers in Kenya, Nigeria, and by the end of the year, this year, we'll be in Uganda and Cote d'Ivoire. Now, that is where donor agencies can come. Uh, and, and three words, and, and three things which I think should frame the thinking in this room should frame how we should look at working with private sectors, um, solving the food systems challenge, which is a very, very, you know, I call it a generational problem for us. This is going to be our biggest problem as a generation. And the first is, it has to be catalytic. Um, you know, we have to use our funds to catalyze innovation. Uh, when I see donor agencies hedging, sketching around innovation or being, you know, cautious, about backing innovation, I feel like, you know, who else will do it if not you? Mm. So you have to catalyze innovation. You have to think big and go. You know, you know pilots, that's probably um, one, of the, one of the greatest blocker, you know, if I use your language. You know, yeah. we should leave the word piloting and embrace failure because for every three failures, you would have two great successes and those would far outweigh the cost of failing. The second one is we have to amplify impact. Uh, when you see private players that come in and choose to work at the bottom of the pyramid, solving some of these problems, addressing food systems, what the private sector bring in is the power to multiply your dollar by 10, bringing in additional investments, bringing in debt, bringing in supplier credits to amplify impact. So we need to think about how can we bring a dollar to back nine of the private sector to then get a drink 10 or probably even $15 impact um, out of that work. And that has to be one of the ways. The third is to reduce the cost of inclusion. Uh, it is expensive to reach the smallholder farmers, to organize the market, to fix supply chains and distribution. It is even more expensive uh, today when, you know, uh, the price of fertilizer is three times what it was two years ago. Um, cost of funding uh, is going to the roof. Um, and it will be the same for the next two to three years. Um, access access to, to markets is becoming even much of a challenge. So we have to think, how can we position ourselves to 
reduce that cost to reach and, and make businesses more inclusive. I, did, I, did, I was waiting for the breath. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we do in radio or TV. <laughs> When's he going to breathe? Okay, he breathed. Let me land, please. Thank you. I, I've given you, you've blown the, the, the budget when it comes to speaker time uh, through the roof. However, I thought I would be elastic because you're the only private sector represented uh, here on the platform. And you spoke in such compelling terms and with a personal touch, which I approve on and nervously looking across to Dr. Kalibata every so often, because she knows you well from your time when you went to her in Rwanda and she backed you when you needed the backing. So that's fantastic. And you showed what you were able to do with that and multiply uh, the impact, which, which is fantastic. Okay. I'm gonna do a, a round of supplementary questions and I'll need briefer answers from everybody. But before I do that, I did promise everybody online and also here that um, if you did have thoughts, questions you wanted to pose, we would try and address them in a timely manner. And um, the first one came in from Gerda Verberg, who's the uh, Sun Movement Coordinator. And she, wish, she says hello and then, She's very interested in, in the CJR contribution. And she says what she thinks is missing a little bit is the focus on producing healthy and nutritious food. And she says, I wish CJR to be more vocal and visible on this. Okay, so I think um, perhaps Claudia, she said this in response to your presentation. Well, the other one is on, on the panel as well. But you would rather Johan takes it or you take it? Johan, okay, you can take that question. Uh, yes, so yeah, we can hear you. So the focus <laughs> on producing healthy mm -hmm. and nutritious food. Yeah I, um, yeah, I don't wanna talk about the past because I was not there in the past. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about the future. Yes. And so since 20, uh, since a year and a bit now, we have a new research strategy, the research strategy for 2030. And this is now being implemented since January of this year. And so a, a very significant part of that is focused on nutrition and healthy foods. And so we have a couple of what we call initiatives now, which are large, uh, fairly large research projects, programs, it would even be better, which are explicitly focused on healthy and nutritious food, sustainably healthy and nutritious food. And we even have a special one focused on, on vegetables and fruits. So I think we're, I'm not sure about the past, but the future, we are very much focused on that. Thank you very much for that, Johan. Um, this one came in from Syed Ahmed, who is working for agricultural sector in his country. Uh, and he said, we're working uh, with village women, farmers, trying to transform and implement through good agriculture practices. How can we help to develop and the capacity and the funding for rural women? Um, that came in after Claudia's presentation, but I'm looking across at Agnes here as the president of Agra. I'm wondering if you want to take Syed Ahmed's question there about developing the capacity and funding for rural women. So thank you for that question. Um, listen, um, there's quite a number of instruments that, uh, that are already available to support rural women. I know IFAD does a whole lot of work on supporting women empowerment. Um, um, my colleague here uh, talked about um, the work we are doing in, uh, in advancing uh, SMEs and, and the hidden middle. We have identified and are working with 3,000 women SMEs. Uh, we've created a, a platform called Value for Her that uh, really uh, helps and, and assures that if you're a woman, woman a woman SME in the agricultural sector, given its complexities and challenges, you actually have a place to go to talk about financing, to talk about technical support, to talk about how to advance your business, to get the moral support that you need to be able to advance businesses. We are, in, in addition to that, we are trying to get the, some of them to advance women in that women business environment. So there are some whose value chains are specifically women value chains. So they go and work, preferentially work with women farmers so that they can create an opportunity to actually give a market to fellow women. I mean, it, it's, it's working, it's a huge opportunity in the avocado sector, for example, in some of these export sectors. And we hope that this is something that can actually start creating opportunities for women as, as an entry point into businesses in poultry, 
in avocado and many other businesses. But it's not the only model, like I said, value for her is an, an important and, and uh, model that we are advancing to also, you also see it at AGRF, it's one of the platforms, but again, there are quite a number of other platforms and opportunities that women can link up and access financing. The, the most important thing is we just have to level the playing ground. We have yeah. to find ways of leveling the playing ground so that women can have access to funding, so that women don't are not required to have collateral because they don't, I mean, they have challenges accessing collateral. And there are ways now of doing that using digitization, using track record, using all sorts of things that can help us ensure that women are never playing ground. And we can also use those same tools to ensure that they have access to the capacities they need to be able to advance businesses. So Fantastic. there's a lot to do there. Thank you very much indeed. A lot to do. And I hope, Syed Ahmed, that uh, answers your question. Um, we've got a few minutes left before we move to uh, our break and then the breakout sessions where we can discuss some of these uh, issues, these uh, challenges and opportunities in more detail. But I want, in, re in rapid response really to the question, and I'm gonna start off with you, um, Madam Karima al Hada in uh, Yemen. What kind of coordinated support from donors and international organizations is needed if we're really going to push forward these national pathways and implement them practice what we preach. Over to you briefly, please. Yes, thank you. I think the first thing is um, to have like a free space of dialogue between the donors and the, the countries on the pathways uh, implementation mechanisms. So we, we can both the, country, the recipient countries and the donors agree on the, the right way. So operationalizing these uh, ways is a first step that need to be discussed with the donors and then agree on the, the, the way forward. Um, I, I think uh, financial and technical support both are required. And maybe at the beginning, the technical support is more required to uh, finalize these pathways and to understand them uh, at sectoral levels also, uh, and uh, as well as to, um, prioritize them. There are many pathways, many working groups, or um, you know, uh, uh, food system uh, actions. So which one is the most uh, important one? Uh, this, uh, this is a, an, a process that needs to be uh, implemented as a, a food system. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Al-Hada. Um, let me go to Finland again then, um, because we heard from the Yemen there, open dialogue, more financial support, technical support. Without these things, it's going to be very hard to implement these, uh, this system transformation. What about in Finland? Um, thank you. I, I Coordinated take support. The, yeah, yeah, the opportunity to, to, to mention one thing, which I think is, is, is important for, the, for the, this community of, of donors. Along with the process of uh, preparations for the Food Systems Summit, a um, very valuable community of uh, actors, uh, a scientific community, uh, dialogue uh, uh, community was, was uh, uh, established. That is, uh, and database, knowledge base, uh, that should not be lost. We should somehow find uh, uh, the resources and ways and means how to uh, not to lose and to develop this tremendous uh, 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 intellectual cap capital mm -hmm. which was uh, created by this preparatory work for the Food Systems Summit. Tremendous. So there's a lot of good work that's been done, but we have to make sure we don't lose it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that important word of momentum Right, that is here now. We want to keep it going. Exactly. And let's uh, then go to back to Cambodia, Dr. Sok Silo. So, what sort of coordinated support from donors and international organizations uh, is, is needed? You hinted at some of this earlier, but be more precise, please, in this, this time. Yes. Actually, uh, we need donor and international organization and UN agency to support us in 
joining the multi-stakeholder uh, platform at the national and sub-national level and provide us the technical assistance or technological uh, support uh, to implement our national uh, pathway as well as to uh, conduct uh, the uh, sub-national dialogue as uh, during the development of the food system roadmap uh, we only conduct uh, online due to the COVID uh, restriction and now we the country is open for uh, economic activity and we are free to go to the field so we need more dialogue at the sub-national level to strengthening uh, the uh, coordination uh, at the sub-national level to join us in uh, food security and nutrition uh, sector as well as the food system. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sok, the silo there. So coordination, uh, regular stakeholder meetings, technical assistance, and um, dialogue at the sub-national level, if I've got you right. Thank you very much indeed. And then uh, briefly, um, from Dr. Swin in there, coordinated, I mean, you did hint at this in your earlier answer, but anything to add to what we've heard on coordinated support? Because we've got to get these pathways to go from paper to people. Does that work? From paper to people, I think it does. Yes. Oh, again, I think uh, we should share the the floor here on on these things. But you know, I think what's what's been really important in particularly, I mean, finance is really central, and so we've yeah. been uh, talking about finance a bit here and there and funding. But I think my colleague from the private sector actually brought it out much more explicitly. And actually, I was part of the finance uh, lever in, in preparation of Food Systems Summit. And so we went through, uh, in, I mean, we spent a lot of time <laughs> discussing and thinking about how the, the, the financing of this food system transformation could work. And it's a big thing, right? So the, the food system transformation. So we need the funding to come in, the financing going from all age, I mean, ec economists talk about agents, all uh, basically everybody involved in this, which goes all the way from the consumer, because consumer spending is probably the most important input in terms of finance in the whole food system. So they have to play a role in terms of directing um, finance to where we want to end up in terms of food system transformation. Then we have to think about SME funding, we have to think about public funding, about private sector funding, global capital market. We have to bring all these people together and make them reinforce each other and all, I mean, they're all doing different things. I mean, the public sector funding has to have a different objective, a different aspect, a different um, component of this whole transformation than the private sector funding. And of course, where they can reinforce each other. I think that's really very important. And I think in that way, they can also very much uh, contribute to a coordination across countries and across national pathways, because particularly if it's cross-border funding, by definition, there is some kind of coordination that needs to take place there. Thank you very much indeed. And, and for our final two inputs, I'm going to change it slightly. Uh, Agnes, to you, first of all. We're going to go to our breakout sessions after our brief break. If there is one question that you think these uh, breakout sessions should be asking or trying to answer, uh, what would it be? Because, I mean, we're going to ask people to consider how national pathways move from good intentions to practical change in food systems. But I mean, you're probably thinking, hmm, there is something else they should address in these breakout sessions. And if there is, if there's something you think they have to address this in the four breakout sessions, what would it be? I mean, listen, we've been around, we've been here and gone around and come back to the yes. same place. The one thing, that we must talk about again and again, which keeps coming out in every um, discussion that people have presented, is we are talking to donors. So the idea of reducing uh, the whole thing of fragmentation around how we coordinate is extremely important. Yeah. We have countries that are committing. We need to see our partners from a country perspective step forward and support these countries. Action needs to happen at country level. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's, there's nothing that is, I mean, if you're trying to transform a country, go to that country, work with that country in what it's doing. Help them coordinate around what they are trying to do so that we stop fragmented efforts everywhere. Yeah. There's private sector, there's public sector. We are working with smallholder farmers in this sector that need the support of public sector. So, and support of public institutions. So that's why we need to coordinate. We need to coordinate because these people cannot transform the sector on their own. Yes. We need to work together. So coordination and better partnerships is what is going to deliver this sector mm -hmm. only when applied in the local context of each country. What is needed in, in, in Finland is very different from what is needed in Rwanda or yes. in Nigeria. And what is going to be needed in some of these countries is all these recommendations have been made by the, the scientific group. We need to shift subsidies in some countries and ensure that these subsidies are not impacting the environment the wrong way and impacting people's health. We must continue supporting these sectors, but we need to rethink the value of these subsidies. Right. On the African continent, on the other hand, we need to coordinate better, reduce fragmentation, ensure that there's that the, the whole or the parts are coming together in a good way. Right now, it's just too much too little everywhere. All right. So. Thank you very much indeed. And now, Ayodeji Balogong, you gave us so much earlier. Briefly, as a private sector guy, what do you think we must address in these breakout sessions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for me, it's an admonition. Let's be brave, let's be bold, and let's think big. Um, there's no other failure that is more than not achieving the SDGs by 2030. So let's think brave. Think bold and be big. Tremendous. Thank you very much indeed. Come on, give a round of applause to our colleagues. Thank you very much to Madam Awahada, Ms. Dr. Silo, Mr. Olila, uh, Dr. Swinon, Dr. Kalibata, and Mr. Balogon. Right. So we're going to have a break for 15 minutes, 15 minute break. Okay. Slightly shorter than we'd anticipated, but because you gave us so much, which is a fantastic thing. And then we're going to go to the various rooms, breakout room A, B, C, and D. And remember, we're going to be asking how national pathways move from good intentions to practical change in food systems. Now, you should have a color coordinated badge. There are four different colors on each, uh, one different color on each badge. You should, and that will tell you oh, there's the blue badge, there's a the red badge. Which other colors are there? Green and, yeah, this is just a letter, oh, fantastic, okay. Oh, a letter, yes, A, B, C, D, fantastic, okay. So the moderators are Ron Hartman, where's Ron? Fantastic, Mauricio Navarra is there, Jim Woodhill is there, and moi-même, Henri Enrico Bonso de Londra. I, I'm here I, as well, fantastic. And so uh, does everybody know where they're going to go? Not yet, probably, you do? Okay, no, so breakout room A, that's in room C400. On the fourth floor, so the C wing is out there and to the right, okay? Breakout room B, that's in room C300, it's on the third floor, C wing to the right. Breakout room C, it's in room number C100, first floor, C wing to the right. And breakout room D, you lucky people, you've got me and you're here in the Italian room, the plenary. So 15 minutes, the coffee is just outside, yes, out right there. And then please be in your rooms ready to discuss by 11.40. Sat down, 11.40. Yes, participants are assigned automatically. Fantastic. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You're free to go. You're free to go. Fantastic. Cheers. Yes. Alessandro, are you there? That's Alessandro in the background. So we've, got, we've got a few people, not many, but... Um... So in this session, 
Uh, we're going to have a short update on national food transformation pathways in, in Niger and Colombia. Then we'll have a discussion within the group on the key levers for taking pathways forward, a discussion of the key implications for donor and UN agencies. And we'll try and draw the messages that we get in this session together and we'll present them back in the plenary. I need somebody who can be a rapporteur. And I'm thinking to myself, who is skilled, vigilant, diligent, and sitting close to me? Elle a dit no. Elle dit no. Well, um, we do need somebody who can be a rapporteur and can feed back to the plenary. Yes. Oh, right. Do they have less? Do they have fewer than we do? Yeah. Would two people here be kind enough to go to breakout room C, which is on which floor? It is on the first floor. On the first floor in the C wing. Dude, uh, Adam, would you like to go to breakout room C? So Adam from Agra is going to go to breakout room C. Do we have another volunteer to go to, to breakout room C? I can Sure. Okay. It, okay, somebody else is going. That reduces our number to one, two, three, four plus Monsieur Photographer. <laughs> okay, we're, we're a little bit thin, but I mean, maybe they're thinner in breakout room C, which is why they've stolen our people. But thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Okay, so uh, we've got two people on the line from Niger and Colombia. So we're going to hear from them, first of all, and they're going to give us an update on what is happening in their country uh, on progress and what they think is essential to taking the, those uh, pathways forward. So, uh, ah, Dr. Kalibata is joining us, that's great. Oh, fantastic. Adam just left to go to breakout room C, but this is great that you've joined us. Okay, so, Sierra, I'm just wondering, because I'm hoping that the technical guys can connect us with um, Mr. Mahamadou Abubakar and Madame Zulma Yanira Fonseca Sento. Okay, yeah. Yes, thank you. And we'll get going. I know, I know, I don't know. Because other people, have, they've all their names are there. That's why. And we need somebody who can be a rapporteur who, who is very focused and very quick and likes taking notes and can feed back to the plenary. Do we have any volunteers? Because I can't, because I have to listen to everything and talk as well. It reminds me of school when the teacher had to pick somebody. Ah, <laughs> oh, right. Okay, Stefanos, thank you very much. Stefanos, would you like to volunteer? You can... oh, of course you will. Well, well, okay. The dean has already... Elle a déjà dit non. It is enough. Does, would you like to be a rapporteur? Oh no, you you Ifad, are you? The photographer, photographers. Anybody else? Let me see who else would. Like Monsieur, what about you? Would you like to be a rapporteur? You don't have to take notes on everything. Just three or four points, because if you look at the, we just want to draw out the key messages four or five key messages from our discussion, and then we'll feed them back to the plenary after lunch. That means yes. That doesn't matter. Which organization are you with? Are you with FAO? Well, that would not disqualify you from T taking down four or five key messages. What was that, sorry? Good, great, fantastic. Fantastic, nothing will disqualify you. Great, wonderful. I, I didn't get your name, is? Peter F-O. Oh, yeah. Peter.
So Peter Vopes from FAO will be our rapporteur, as it were, and will feed back. So I'm delighted. Ah, I can see two people now. This is wonderful. Pleased to have you with, with us, Mr. Mahamadou Abubakar. I remember you from a previous Zoom session that we did some months yeah. ago. How are you? Tu va bien au Niger? Tu, tu, tu va bien au Niger. Sauf que là, je, 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 je pense que c'est traduit. Malheureusement, je ne euh, crois pas qu'il y a une traduction. Euh, je ne crois pas qu'il y a un interprète, je ne crois pas, ici aujourd'hui. Ça vous plaît de parler en anglais? Oui. oui. Ouais, ok, bon. Je crois qu'il est indiqué oui. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mamadou. And Madame Zulma Yanira Fonseca Sento from Colombia, will you? I hope you'll be speaking in English also. I'd not speak be. English at all. <laughs> Mamadou, please. You. I can understand. I can understand. I can. Yes, you can. I speak in English. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay. So I don't know how much of the earlier sessions. Mamadou, yes. Ah, he's Good. frozen. He's frozen. Mamadou, yes, please speak. Ooh. We've got a problem with the signal. Okay, you're back yeah. with us. Go on. Vous êtes là? Please speak. Yes. Oh, you, I think you've been muted. You're on mute. Okay, Mohamedou, we're going to start in a moment, okay? Thank you very much to both of you, Mohamedou and Zuma. So we're going to hear from Niger and Colombia. And earlier in the program, we heard from Finland, we heard from uh, Yemen also, and Cambodia. We got the picture from those three countries, what the challenges were and the opportunities when it came from translating the pathways in theory to implementing in practice. Now, in these um, breakout sessions, we're going to hear from two countries in each session. And in this session, it's your two countries, Niger and Colombia. And I'm going to ask you, basically, to give us an update on the national food system transformation pathway in your respective countries, just for a five or six minutes each. And then we are going to respond to what you've said. And then we'll feed back to you and we'll get a dialogue going. And so by the end, we will have four or five key messages that we will feed back to the plenary session, but based on what you've told us about your countries, okay? So I'm going to start off with you, Zulma Yanira von Sekel Centeno. You're smiling and I say it with vigor because I love your name. Right. So please tell us then about progress on national pathways in Colombia and what you think is essential to take them forward. You've got five, six minutes, okay? Please talk to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to share our experience to the implementation of our pathway. Uh, so we define uh, the Colombia moves towards the transformation of equitable, healthy, sustainable, and resilient food systems pathway last year. Uh, for its implementation, uh, we have a work plan has been established with specific commitments and responsibilities by the Intersectoral Commission for Food and Nutrition Security. Uh, this commission is comprised of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Ministry of Health and Social Protection, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Housing, City and Territory, Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Tourism, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, National Planning Department, Rural Development Agency, Social Prosperity, 
Colombian Institute of Family Welfare and the Colombian Association uh, of Nutrition and Dietetics Faculties. The action established for each of the action paths in the country pathways require regular, regulatory support through policy instruments that guarantee the financial and technical resources for its implementation. We have some advances in the implementation for uh, each uh, uh, action track. For example, in the track one, ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all, we have something called the Grid Alliance for Nutrition, that is a strategy led by the First Lady in our country uh, that was implemented with the following, following objectives. First one, position child nutrition as a national cause, mobilize and coordinate actors in concerted initiatives that generate impact on child nutrition, to take advantage of knowledge, experience, and resources to advance towards equal opportunities for children. We have some results to implement the Great Alliance. For example, a ship 39 a reduction, percent reduction in reported deaths of children under five years uh, due to and associated with undernutrition that uh, is still uh, a problem in our country. And also we have other uh, result, important result that is the uh, implementation of the 10 year breastfeeding and complementary feeding plan. For the action track two, adopting sustainable consumption patterns, we advanced with the implementation of the public procurement law to strengthen local value chains and short food supply chains. Also, we progress uh, in the implementation of the national plan for the promotion of the peace and family and community economy to support projects and initiatives to shore food supply chains. The law for the adoption of measures to promote healthy food environments and prevent non-communicable disease was enacted. Also, we had some advances in promoting environmentally friendly production. We have a policy to prevent and reduce and reduce food losses and waste was formulated and adopted in March of this year. And this is an important initiative in, in, the, in the region. Update of the environment with guidelines uh, for banana, coffee, cocoa, horticulture, and potato production with a focus on circular economy is also working in the, in the country. Uh, we have done also uh, implementation of the rapid response to the pandemic and economic reactivation policy that is continued now uh, after uh, the pandemic. For now, I, I think this is the advance that we have uh, in our pathway. Fantastic, um, Zuma. I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up. How challenging was it to bring all these tracks together uh, to actually turn the aims into something concrete. How much of a challenge was that? Uh, now, uh, we is currently, Colombia is currently undergoing a chain of government. We have to take care of our pathway uh, is following in the in the next government. In August, we, we will have a new president and we'll establish the national development plan for the next four years. So in this context, we expect uh, to have allocation of technical and economic resource for the implementation, monitoring and evaluation of the food system transformation pathway. Uh, also, we hope to, the implementation of the pathway uh, requires citizen, citizen particip participation as well as sectoral and intersectoral articulation and communication with the national government and the local level. 
and a day of the pathway actions and compromise to face the new challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, uh, we have uh, an important, we have, uh, we must be adapted uh, the pathway according to the situation that affect national food security, such as the current war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, we has had a notable impact on food prices, especially on food production supplies. These are the principal challenges now. Tremendous. Thank you very much indeed to Zuma Yanira Fonseca Cento, 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 Centeno, should I say. Um, fantastic. Okay, so let's hear now from Niger. Uh, we have uh, Monsieur Mohamedou Aboubakar, who is the coordinator and focal point at the O Commissariat de l'Initiative uh, 3N. So, Cellule Nutrition, Scaling Up Nutrition, Niger. Uh, do we have you, Monsieur Aboubakar? Let's see if we can see him. He appears to have dropped off the line. If we can try and get him back, please. In the meantime, let's see if we can get any responses to what we heard from uh, in terms of Zuma's presentation from Colombia, while we're waiting for Monsieur Abubakar to rejoin us. I think he had a, quite a difficult line there. Uh, Stefanos, let me um, go to you, first of all, because it seems that one of the challenges for Col Colombia is that they're in transition at the moment. So under the previous or the outgoing administration, um, there seems to have been adoption of a national plan the problem is a new government will come in and it may have different priorities. It may tinker with the plan. I mean, I'm sure Zuma is hoping yeah. that whatever was agreed previously will continue. But your brief reflections on what she said, uh, just very quickly, before we go back to uh, Abubakar. Something that strikes me is that she mentioned about specific quantitative targets. Yes. She said 39% reduction. I didn't get it. Please wait one minute, uh, yeah. Bubaka, yes. And I think these could be motivations for any new administration. Because yes. if you had a national process that came up with specific targets, this is something that can be used. Yes. So I think transitions are happening all the time. And we need to see transitions as an opportunity to, uh, to, to take things forward. Yes. The best the best way to do this, and I do know about transitioning of governments, yeah. is to make the new administration take ownership of this thing. Yeah. So not present it as something like that we have prepared this for you, but there's an opportunity here and we need your new leadership to understand how this could be taken forward. Yeah. So for me, this is the way to, to deal with transitions. Another thing is that I think that big part of the national processes for the dialogues was run by the technical people in the ministries. Yeah. And, and these, in most cases, remain there, if not all, a, a good group of them. So I think in finding the links between the technical people and the new political appointees, that it will make the, the, the difference. And the third is that um, <clears throat> it's a pressure also, I mean, the, the food system dialogues was the multi-stakeholder process. So it's not only the, the internally the government or the administration fighting to continue something, but it's using the stakeholders, the private sector, the youth to make clear that that was an achievement of the people and yeah. needs to be maintained. Very good. Thank you, Stefan. That was a really, really uh, good uh, response there. Uh, that really was very, very helpful. So um, I'm pleased to say, Monsieur uh, Mahamadou Aboubakar, we now would like to hear a few minutes from you on what is happening in uh, Niger as far as the uh, food systems transformation pathway. We'll give us a progress update, please, from Niger. Merci, merci à vous. J'espère que vous me permettrez de parler français. Aha, well, not everybody here. We have no interpretation service, sadly. Malheureusement, il n'y a pas d'interprète. Et moi, euh, bon, je comprends le français, mais euh, je ne suis pas du tout capable de traduire 
euh, à chaque pas. Mais nous avons quelqu'un qui peut faire ça. Oui. Yes, oui, okay. No. okay. Okay, okay. But uh, please beware that you will have to stop after three sentences. Okay. So that she can translate, okay? Okay. 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 I can I, I can try to speak uh, slowly. Uh, yes. I need more yes. time. <laughs> yes. But it's important, Abubakar. It's um, important that you uh, stop after each in, after three in sentences. Niger, yes. Oui. Allez-y. Et ok. Je suis en train de partir, mais il y a il faut qu'on désactive la transcription en direct parce que là il y a un il y a une interférence chez moi. Parfait. Merci. Donc, je vais aller doucement pour dire que au Niger, euh, en tout cas, merci de, de nous avoir fait l'honneur d'être invité. Et de participer à cette euh, euh, assemblée. Oui. Pour le Niger, il faut dire que nous avons. Donc, nous avons, nous nous sommes appuyés sur l'existant pour identifier cette voie, cette voie pour la transformation des systèmes alimentaires. Ces sept voies traduisent les défis que nous rencontrons au Niger. Le premier défi, c'est l'amélioration de la gouvernance et le financement des systèmes alimentaires. Le deuxième levier ou défi ou la voie, c'est l'impulsion des réformes administratives et législatives assortie d'accès facilitant l'opérationnalisation de ces réformes-là. OK, pour l'instant, Aboubakar, merci. So, please stop for now so that uh, we can have our interpretation of what you have said. La troisième voie, c'est la promotion des chaînes de valeur. Uh, Dr. Aboubakar, si vous voulez, arrêtez, s'il vous plaît, pour l'instant, parce qu'il y a ma collègue ici, qui va faire l'interprétation de ce que vous avez dit jusqu'ici. So okay. please, yes, okay, he's gonna, she's gonna, yeah. Okay, and it's informal interpretation. So basically he thanks you for uh, the invitation to participate in this meeting. And he says in Niger, they have identified uh, seven pathways, if we can say priorities for food system transformation, which are based on the challenges they face today. The number one is the improvement of the governance system. Uh, for food system transformation. The number two is a reform of administrative, uh, an administrative and legislative uh, reform to put in place the policies that are required for food system transformation. Mm -hmm. And he was just starting with the third one, which is basically a value chain promotion. So that's where he stopped. Voilà. Alors, Monsieur le Docteur Aboubakar, oui, si merci. vous voulez continuer. Continuer avec la quatrième voie, qui oui. est le renforcement de la recherche et de l'innovation pour les systèmes alimentaires durables. La cinquième, c'est la promotion et le renforcement de la vulgarisation et de l'appui conseil agricole. La sixième voie, c'est le renforcement de la résilience et du relèvement. Et la septième, c'est la promotion des données statistiques de qualité pour l'aide à la décision. Donc, voilà. Donc, ces voix sont... Oui. Oui, oui. OK, très bien. Alors, les sept voix sont opérationnalisées dans notre plan d'action pour la mise en œuvre de notre politique 
nationale pour la sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle qui est l'initiative 3N. Et toutes ces voies ont été identifiées à la suite des concertations multi-acteurs qu'on a organisées au niveau national jusqu'au niveau sous-national, sub-national, avec l'appui des différents acteurs intervenant dans le domaine de la sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle. Je veux dire par là les donateurs, les réseaux sont... Je, 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 je veux attendre pour la transcription. Pour la... Oui, merci. merci. <laughs> good. Very good, Dr. Aboubakar. He knows now. He knows. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, so, Madame Nadine va faire l'interprétation. So, we're now going to get our second round of interpretation. Sorry to put so much pressure on you, please. I'm not trying maybe. So, he mentioned the seven priorities. Uh, for the food system transformation, as I mentioned, it's governance number one, administrative and legal reform, uh, promotion of um, selected value chain. It had a uh, focus on research and innovation, uh, extension services, um, attention also to resilience and recovery, and finally, uh, data uh, to inform and guide decision making. He says these set seven priorities have been operationalized in the national policy for food security. And uh, it was based on a multi-stakeholder consultation, which took place at the national and at the sub-national level with the support of, of um, their partners, including um, donors. And that's where he stopped. Wonderful. Okay, so Mamadou Aboubakar, c'est à vous encore une fois. Over to you. Vous avez la parole. Oui. Ah, vous êtes muté, je crois. <laughs> You're on mute. En fait, j'ai une interférence. C'est pour ça que j'ai demandé de désactiver la transcription en direct. Donc, ça fait que il y a toujours le passage encore. Oh, he's hearing some interpretation. Mais je pense que ça doit être à votre niveau puisqu'il n'y a pas d'interprétation ici. Donc, nous entendons des voix chez vous, mais il n'y a pas d'interprétation ici. Il y a une transcription en direct. En tout cas, une transcription en direct non. chez moi. Voilà. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think what may be happening is that the people online are getting interpretation. It could be that's what's happening, but we here in the room are not getting any interpretation apart from the excellent Nadine here, my <laughs> colleague. So we'll have to continue like this, Abubakar. So please uh, come to your conclusion, please, so that we can then get uh, Nadine to interpret. Okay. Donc, je peux aller rapidement en disant que tout, toutes ces voies, la mise en œuvre de toutes ces voies est en cours. Oui, exact. En fait, sur l'écran, c'est écrit CC, transcription en direct. J'ai euh, touché et ça fait, l'autre a activé la transcription en direct pour la réunion. Oui. I understand, oui, je comprends, mais ce n'est pas pour les gens ici, dans la salle. C'est okay. pour les gens en Zoom. Nous ne recevons pas l'interprétation, sauf par euh, Nadine. Donc, désolé pour ce, ce désagrément technique, sinon ce que je peux dire. Voilà. Alors, euh, je disais que ces voix, leur mise en œuvre de pas... Ouais. Um, Abu Bakar, um, please continue um, and talk to us, please. Monsieur Boubacar, est-ce que vous êtes en mesure, Aboubacar, vous êtes en mesure de nous parler? 
Oui, je, je vous entends. Je peux vous parler. En fait, chaque fois que je parle, il y a toujours ce que j'ai dit qui vient encore en plus. Et ce que vous dites qui vient, et ça fait double parole. Mais soit. Oh. Je pense, je pense que c'est quelque Olivier, chose que vous avons... devez désactiver sur votre ordinateur. Vous avez activé la. Euh, vous avez dit la traduction simultanée. Donc, essayez de voir si vous pouvez la désactiver sur votre ordinateur, puisque ce n'est pas quelque chose qui a été fait ici. Oui, j'essaie parce que je vois l'autre a activé la transcription en direct pour la réunion. Euh, si vous regardez en bas, après, après ah, participant, ah, discussion, partage. Mm -hmm. ah, live transcript. Do you see the CC? There's something live transcript here, CC, and it says it's activated. Oh, right, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the fourth button. We and don't have that. Well, it's apparently it needs to be disactivated by by the technicians because he says that he's getting back everything he said. Oh, he's getting the feedback. Yes, everything is. Do you understand what is complete? Okay, Monsieur Aboubakar, ils sont en train de regarder avec les techniciens. Vous pouvez continuer entre temps malgré les désagréments. Vous voulez continuer? Oui. Allez-y. Euh... Je peux vous dire que la mise en œuvre de ces voies-là est faite à travers notre politique nationale de sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle, qui est l'initiative 3N. Et, et bien sûr, nous sommes un pays qui a une longue histoire de crise alimentaire et nutritionnelle. Et, euh, et bien sûr, euh, à cela, en, en plus des, des défis connus, euh, s'ajoute l'insécurité, parce que le Niger est un pays du Sahel. Donc, euh, donc, nous sommes en train de mettre en œuvre, en tenant en compte les défis nouveaux, euh, en faisant le lien entre l'urgence et le développement. Donc, euh, la mise en œuvre de ces voies-là, évidemment, nécessite beaucoup de ressources. Et euh, notre principale priorité, c'est la mobilisation des acteurs et la mobilisation des ressources en mettant l'accent sur la, la qualité de la dépense et activer ces leviers-là pour euh, des voies ou pour, en tout cas, lever ou répondre à ces grands défis de sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle au Niger. Alors, il faut... Si vous permettez que je, je continue, nous avons pour opérationnaliser ces voies, euh, I think uh, Boubaka, we have received your main points. I think we understand how you have gone from the national pathways or from the summit last year, the UN summit, to your own country-specific national pathway and the challenges you're facing in mobilizing and embracing what you know you have to do. So for the moment, thank you very much indeed for that. What we want to do now is to take the two examples of Colombia and Niger and see if we can work out in this room and with the people contributing online, what are the key drivers? We want three to four key drivers for taking national pathways forward. Now we heard earlier in the previous plenary sessions that coordination was one of them financing uh, another mobilization data. But this is me pulling out some of the things that I took from those earlier sessions. But looking specifically at Colombia and Niger, I want to involve our colleagues in the room um, and get from them what they think are key drivers for taking national pathways forward. Does anybody want to kick us off, to start us off? Talk about their own countries. Yes, that's good, yes. And you can also talk about your own countries because that will help 
to feed into the drivers that we're going to uh, take forward and feed back to the plenary. Does anybody want to start us off with a key driver? I'm looking at you, Agnes, a little bit. <laughs> I know you will have at least one driver. I know that. Yes, please. Oh, I just, yes. Is this on? Yes, it is on, yes. Yeah, very good. Oh, could you put it towards you, I think? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So thank you both, uh, both of you, um, our colleague from Niger and, and from, from Colombia. First of all, for being such a central part of participating in the food systems, uh, dialogues and conversations, the national pathways. I think Colombia, you asked a specific question around how the, the transition in Colombia is going to affect the work you're doing. I, I honestly believe and have seen your government involved in many international places, especially to do with food systems, taking leadership and demonstrating leadership. I, I, it's almost becoming like second nature. So I, I, I'm not sure that, that this is something that your country would want to drop. Uh, so maybe the, the real issue here is how um, our colleagues in the hub uh, can work with you all to bring to speed your government and help them come to speed with regards to where what had been achieved. Uh, so you can work with the hub and, and make sure that the administration is briefed very early on uh, with regards to the commitments they made in the Food System Summit, but also with regards to overall perception and engagement that you, you all have been able to achieve through the commitments that your government has, has made. Mm -hmm. I think Stefano, Stefano has put it very well. So. I'll follow up with, with the hub and making sure that, 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 again, things happen quickly, I think would be really good. In terms of drivers, uh, as we go forward, I mean, you, you're doing already an amazing job of trying to identify the gaps, because what we don't know, we don't know, right? So being able to identify the gaps and being very clear uh, how these gaps are connected in the food system, and being able to be very clear around once you have this, you're able to write it into something that you can share with people who you want to participate, to fund, but also your government, you want your government to fund you, right? So you want to make sure that your government has visibility of what the depth of the problem, but also the possible opportunities and solutions to this problem that they can, they can work on. So I think documenting it and putting really a, a critical plan forward would be good. Then of course, I, the biggest driver, like I said earlier, is going to be how sectors coordinate. You mentioned so many sectors. And I thought that um, maybe it's not going to be easy to start with all of them. It might be wise to start with a few that are very straightforward and be able to, to learn from that process. If, if maybe starting with many might be overwhelming, but if you started with a few and said, okay, these, these sectors have the biggest footprint um, from, uh, or have the biggest opportunity to deliver from a food system perspective, then you might be able to, to work out a coordination mechanism that then allows you to bring on board uh, more as you go. You know, so, so I, I think in, because the sector is already too complex, maybe starting simple, is one of the best answers than, than starting complex. So you, you, you have complexity of factors and you don't know how to differentiate who, what is causing, causing what problem. Mm -hmm. so, so I really think that for me, that would be the biggest drive. And then I don't know, um, Colombia is middle income country. So I, I think the role of private sector there is huge. So being able to define the place and role of private sector as a critical driver to, to advancing food systems, what, the public part and the private sector part will be critical. Uh, in Niger, I, I, I think same approach, uh, which is going to be really, really important. And then maybe in Niger, one of the biggest challenges I'm saying, seeing today, which relates to the times we are in is this whole food crisis and its impact on people and impact on environment. So strengthening resilience, and, and looking at the collaboration between institutions to strengthen resilience, 
taking advantage of the Sahel in your, don't, don't, don't create new things, build also on things that are already there. How do you take advantage of the, the Sahel transformation program and starting with that and, and making sure that all the partners that are involved in the Sahel transformation program are also involved in your food systems transformation, being very clear what, what they, how, how what they do impacts food, right? Access to food. And the ability to strengthen the resilience of communities. So that's probably how I would go mm -hmm. for it. But I think for Niger, the biggest driver of food system is going to be strengthening resilience. Strengthening uh, of resilience, course, yeah. of course, the other two will play in coordination. You know, coordination mechanisms, finding finding um, ways to bring partners together. But uh, strengthening mm -hmm. resilience is going to be a very huge entry point for for Niger. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for that, Agnes. Um, Yes, I mean, um, strengthening uh, that uh, re resilience and, and the coordination as well to critical uh, drivers. L let's see if you have any more drivers. Yeah, Peter, yes. Yeah, it's a good idea to move. <laughs> yeah, this one seems yes. to work. Okay, so since I have to report on this, I also offer my... Uh... Yeah, please, you're welcome. I mean, I think the, the first thing I heard uh, across both country examples is multi-stakeholder consultations, yeah. right? So really to make this a national process um, way beyond uh, those actors who are typically maybe involved in agri-food agri systems. Um, and then second, secondly, um, I think it's again, multi-thematic. Right. Um, I guess was just referring to this. Uh, I was actually compelled by the breadth of uh, the interpretation of, uh, let's say, the food systems concept. Mm -hmm. Right. If we take uh, health on board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for me, that makes great sense because what we are aiming at is transformation. Right. And it's really economic and societal transformation. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about the agriculture sector and we're not only talking about the food system. We know that if this transformation within the food system is not taking place, then economies will not transform. Mm -hmm. So having this, this breath, and I fully agree, it's complicated to get everybody on board from, from the onset. Uh, but I think making these linkages specifically to health uh, this uh, this makes great sense, and this seems to be an underlying principle of these uh, national uh, food system pathways, that they are really broad in terms of stakeholder and thematic uh, in involvement, which leads to something like policy coherence, right, yeah. across all these different policy uh, policy uh, sectors and getting everybody on board. And you need to get everybody on board across all policy areas in order to get the finances to actually invest into the into the transformation. Yeah. Um, and I guess that I see as, uh, as one of the major uh, drivers. And then I think what was also mentioned is um, how do you actually check uh, sort of progress on the way? So yeah. the entire sort of M&E um, issue that goes with it, uh, it, it will inevitably be a driver because if what has been already achieved, what is being implemented is not really uh, meticulously observed uh, and checked against, and then also providing an opportunity for adjusting on the way uh, as implementation uh, operationalization is taking place. I guess that is uh, that is fundamental. Right. Thank you very much. So, I mean, out of those, I mean, I think that the policy coherence, I think, is one of the critical drivers. Uh, just distilling what you were saying, and then methods of checking progress, but accountability, as Agnes said earlier, uh, and um, the fact that um, the stakeholder consultation goes way beyond the usual actors, whom sometimes we always call upon in dialogues like this. You think it should go beyond those actors? I mean, one aspect on this, um, no, in, I think in terms of actors by, by thematic or policy area, yes. I guess what we heard from Colombia that uh, seems all already be inclusive, right? But yes. then really, in the, it's one thing who is engaged in the in the public uh, sphere yeah. uh, in really, um, in, let's say, implementing uh, the, the pathway. The other thing is the upfront 
um, consultation, the national consultation yes. with civil society, right? Mm -hmm. And there, for instance, I mean, I'm one of the co-chairs of the technical working group of yeah. youth employment. So getting youth on board, for instance, yes. adequately in those processes, have their voices, their opinions, I guess that is absolutely critical and right. crucial and should be also one driving uh, aspect in the whole process. Well, we're talking about youth in some detail tomorrow, I think. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm so hear from you then. Um, oh, Agnes, you've caught my eye. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Henry. I think for me, one uh, one of the driver, and I want to go back to what uh, Ayodeji said uh, before from Afex, is that a food system might be one of the biggest uh, generational challenge uh, we are facing. And you were just talking about the societal change, transformation, transformational yeah. change. And I think for me, a big driver is uh, social mobilization. Mm. I think just like it was with climate, uh, we need to get the issue of food systems out of this very kind of specialized room and audience and get it out there. Uh, so that basically uh, when uh, Zuma was talking about the follow-up by the next government, if it's really kind of a um, society project mm -hmm. uh, that does the adherence of the whole society, uh, just mm -hmm. like now climate, you see the young people on the yeah. street, they're making it their agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, a food system is the next big challenge we are facing. We need to do the same work, that we need to get it out there. Yeah. And when you see a, a child not talking to you about climate change, it wasn't the case 20 years ago. Yes. So uh, I think food systems, we need to kind of mainstream and make this issue accessible to everybody so that it becomes um, a real um, agenda. Even if we say the stakeholder engagement if if I get out now to the market next door and I see climate change, everybody will speak to me. But if I see food systems, I think I will just have very weird looks like, what, what is were. she talking about? Yeah, this food here, about? what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, the, That's fantastic. the point I wanted to make. Indeed, thank you very much indeed. Stefanos, yes. I want to build up on this and actually connect this with the stakeholder engagement and make three observations. One is that I do agree we need community projects, we need social projects, we need even in some cases if we have the chance to substitute the representative democracy with the participatory democracy to do this. And I think food is an area we can do this. When it comes to the stakeholders, I think, I mean, we have gone through decades of stakeholder engagement and, and now we see a lot of very good uh, examples of good stakeholder engagement. I don't know how to say this politically correct, but I'm going to oh, say it. God. Sometimes we involve stakeholders that they do noise yeah. without necessarily being the ones that they need to be involved, and we forget the ones that they are suffering. Yeah. So I think that the first ones that they need to go to the table is the ones that they are receiving the consequences of transformations mm -hmm. or receiving the consequences of, of impact. So when it mm -hmm. comes to to climate change, for example, there's no stakeholder than a poor farmer that it's more relevant to this thing. And I don't know how much they represent it. Mm. And the third thing I want to say is that the stakeholder process is not there to, to, to listen to them. It's, it's there to have them co-create a solution with them. So it's not about asking the stakeholders what they think thing on this or that, but asking to find solutions from them because the solutions should come from the ones that they face, the dear reality of having to deal with the systems. Now, I, I agree, if we go out and ask someone about food systems, probably 99% they will look at us like aliens. Mm -hmm. It brings me back 17 years when I started my career in the UN, and my first job was to go to the so-called Sustainable Consumption and Production branch of the United Nations Environment Program. And at that point, I had a problem to explain to anyone what I'm doing. Because nobody knew sustainable consumption and production. I couldn't explain to my colleagues. Today I came to this room and there's an intern here. And when I asked her what she studied, she told me I'm studying food and sustainable consumption and production. <laughs> and my soul smiled. I'm sure. My soul smiled. So I think with the hub, Nadine, we can do this. We can do the food system something that the people will talk and they will know about. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. We need to rattle through. A couple of other things. We heard this morning that more support was needed from donors and UN agencies. The question is, what kind of support? Any thoughts from this side of the room? Because of course, donors and UN agencies are supporting already, but is it the right kind of support? What support do you think is needed? Because we want to 
tell our colleagues in the plenary that we think A, B, or C. So people on this side of the room, I'm just looking. Agnes has already spoken. I'm not going to put her under more pressure, but Madame there, you're there. What do you think? What kind of support is needed? Well, I thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, yeah. I think we need to be exploring more innovative ways of financing, okay? Yeah. I think uh, inevitably demands are always going to exceed the amount of funds that public funding that there is out there at the moment. Yeah. So we have to look at a number of different opportunities. One, I think we have to look for exciting ways of working more effectively together with the private sector. Two, we have to look at catalytic funding. Instead of giving grants or concessionary loans at scale, we also need to look at matching grant mechanisms and challenge funds to try and actually catalyze more interest and more investment into the sector. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think associated with these two areas, I think there's a, a, a sort of a packaging issue that the, the whole food system for many years hasn't received the attention it deserved. And right now it's receiving it for some of the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to do is actually make the food system look like an exciting opportunity mm -hmm. for, for youth to, to start investing in, instead of it being a default option because nobody could get a job and leave the mm -hmm. family farm, they end up working there. Instead, people are actually seeking to go and uh, e e expand activities mm -hmm. on the family farm. And I think above all else, we have to listen to people on the ground who are yeah. farming. I think for far too long, there have been top-down solutions I think some of those have worked, but many of them haven't. So we need to work very, very closely with the farmers themselves to try and understand what exactly yeah, will work yeah. going forwards. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. No, I, I like the idea of making um, food and food transformation interesting and exciting as opposed to a fallback option because there was no other job. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, trying to excite, especially younger people, people coming in with talent and energy and ideas and making them think that this is something I could do something for my career and build up a business in this way and be part of this transformation. Yeah. Getting them excited. Um, anybody else on support needed from donors and key UN agencies? Because we now want to move to key messages to report back to everyone when we do the plenary after lunch. Um, it's looking at you over there. No, before, uh, sorry, Agnes, one more. Yes, thank you. You can give us a key message, which could be your on support needed from donors and UN agencies. There we go. Yes, hi. Um, hi, good afternoon. So I think um, key messages in terms of donors is rapid. Um, uh, rapid funding mechanisms. Uh, that's one that we need uh, immediately in terms of support, but also in terms of integrated um, funding. So looking cross-sectoral, as, as my colleague um, uh, alluded to, catalytic, innovative, challenging, looking at grants. Um, some of the African countries that we support are indebted significantly, mm -hmm. and, and we continue to put them in, in greater debt. So, so really looking at flexible um, mechanisms that can help support and build the resilience of these of these governments would be critical, especially now. Thank you. Which organization are you with? I'm with Agra. With, ah, okay. <laughs> I see. Fantastic. Okay. Yes, we don't want to load debt upon debt. You know, uh, countries that are already struggling and going deeper and deeper. Great. So, I like the idea of rapid funding mechanisms. How long is the cycle, you know? Uh, and your situation may have changed by the time the money finally lands. Yes. Gentleman next to you, who's uh, looking intently at his screen. Hello, sir. I'm looking at, what, do anybody know this gentleman's name? Sven. What? Ah, <laughs> I'm just wondering, I can see your focus and I thought it would be good to hear very briefly from you. What do you think a key message should be that we take back to the broader group because our colleague from Agra was talking about 
rapid funding mechanisms and we shouldn't be loading debt upon debt. We want to integrate some of the grants, you know, so they make sense. Any, any thoughts from you? What should the message be? You've heard from Niger, you've heard from Colombia. What do you think we should take back to the group in terms of a message? I think a lot of it was mentioned before yeah. already. And um, when I was uh, still really listening, I would like to um, to stress what uh, the colleague Peter already said. Yeah. Um, so looking um, what is necessary on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it was also mentioned before, um, the, the ideas need um, to come from the countries yes. are um, somehow already um, put into these national um, pathway mm -hmm. um, strategies. Yes. And um, what um, I also liked about the Food System Summit process mm -hmm. was um, the involvement, involvement of various uh, stakeholders and especially um, the youth. Mm -hmm. This is where our um, heart also lies because I'm also co-chair of um, the thematic working group um, on rural um, youth employment. Ah. So um, to me, it would be really important to uh, uh, get and have youth um, at the table and involved yeah. in all these um, planning. Youth with their energy and, uh, energy and ideas and hopefully not stuck in a particular model. That's, yes. that's the, the idea. Thank you very much. Um, before we round up this session, let's um, hear back from our colleagues in uh, Colombia. This is very brief now. Uh, Agnes, yes, yes. I see there are about 29 people online. Oh. Yes. I see there are about 29 people online. Uh, hmm. Maybe you don't have visibility of what's online, but maybe some of them have questions. Some yes, indeed, them, I'm looking yeah, there. Yeah, I think it would Do be we have to... any questions? Sierra, can you see any questions in the chat for um, Colombia or Niger or relating to this breakout session? Maybe one or two of them have ideas for that we should take into the next session or have ideas on support or key drivers. Because sadly, I cannot see them from here. Just, just some comments. Okay, okay, that's fine. All right. There's a hand. Oh, Dr. Abubakar's hand. Yeah. Dr. Abubakar, please yeah. come back into vision. Thank you we very much. We're going to be ending this session soon. Please tell us what do you think the key message should be from this breakout session that we're going to take into the next session? What is the key message from Niger? Merci, merci beaucoup. Je m'excuse tout à l'heure pour les, pour les désagréments techniques. Il y avait une vidéo qui passait et donc il y avait cette interférence. Euh, les, clés, les messages clés, les deux messages clés pour nous, c'est comment accompagner la gouvernance pour actionner ces leviers et tendre vers des systèmes alimentaires transformés. Euh, accompagner, comment accompagner les États pour la mobilisation des, des ressources et comment euh, supporter les États pour la mise en place des mesures qui leur permettent justement euh, de, de, de réussir leur politique euh, de financement euh, qui parviendrait aux, aux petits producteurs. Euh, je veux dire par là au niveau euh, euh, via peut-être des canaux comme la microfinance. Euh, supporter la société civile et jusqu'à atteindre le secteur privé pour pouvoir transformer les systèmes alimentaires et ainsi, ainsi que les institutions de recherche pour les innovations. Alors, euh, tous ces deux messages, je les ai mis euh, dans, le, dans le chat box pour qu'on pour qu puisse les voir et pouvoir les prendre en compte, sachant que la barrière de la langue est là. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abubakar. And we'll get our um, contribution um, from uh, Colombia in just a moment. But um, Nadine, just thinking about those two key messages that we're going to take away from Niger, what, what are they? His two key messages is how can um, um, they be supported in, in putting in place, the countries can be supported in putting in place the right governance system 
for food system transformation? And how can they be supported as well to mobilize resources, a country like Niger? And finally, how can they be supported to put in place the right policy measures and uh, financing that will benefit uh, small uh, producers? And he's also talking about policy measures and investment for microfinance, research and innovation, mobilization of the private sector among other things. Nadine, thank you very much. You're, you're outstanding. Thank you. Um, fantastic. So, so um, Peter, did you get all of that? <laughs> Most of it. Um, if you can repeat for, for one second. Uh, yeah, Nadine, if you can just repeat. Okay, then, Zuma, let's hear from you from uh, Colombia, please. The fi final message, please. Thank you. I think for the session, we have some important messages like the importance of intersectoral articulation, private sector linkage, bringing all the stakeholders closer to feed systems issues, uh, and also technical and financial support from cooperation agencies for the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the food system transformation pathway is important. Facilitate the knowledge exchange that contribute for the transformation of the national food systems. And uh, also is, is so important, emphasize on a right to food perspective in the policies. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's wonderful. So we have uh, come to the end of this particular session. Let me thank Dr. Mahamadou Abubakar from Niger and Madame Zulma Yanira Francesca Centeno uh, from Colombia. So we have uh, looked at some of the challenges and the opportunities in uh, Niger and Colombia. We've hopefully distilled what you said into a few key messages, we have heard what the UN agencies and uh, the other partners might be able to do to support you in your national pathways towards transformation. And we will feed back what you said to the plenary a little bit later on this afternoon. But let me thank you very much. Uh, from, are you in Bogota and Yemi? Where are you both? You're in Bogota, where are you? Now I am in the Quito, uh, one of the <laughs> poorest okay. uh, cities in Colombia. We are ah, working here in Chocó. Beautiful, uh, fantastic. And um, Bubaka, where are you? Are you je, suis au, je suis au Haut Commissariat Administratif 3N. Ici à Niamey, je suis à Niamey. Je n'ai pas pu uh, ah. bouger. <laughs> je suis... Fantastic. J'ai interrompu en ligne. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank you very much to the people in the room. Peter, I know you've been scribbling away and you will distill them down to four messages or so. And we will let people know what we discussed elegantly with great interpretation from the Dean and contribution from all our esteemed colleagues. Thank you very much. And I believe we now have time to eat and be sustained because believe you me, I need some nourishment. I need some good quality sustainable, wholesome, nourishing food. I need my carbohydrates. I may, need even, I may even need some meat. I may even need some meat in order to get through. And of course, yes, that's, and also some hydration because people often forget about the importance of hydration. Not Coca-Cola, I'm talking about water. Agua, H2O, the stuff of life. Bread, yes, but water. Thank you very much. So I believe, Sierra, that uh, food is just out there, is it? Thank you very much. And so we resume our chat, our deliberations at 2 p.m. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the break. And I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, yeah, with uh, Abubakar's, I think, probably, I don't know quite what happened. But...
over the break and that you have been properly watered, uh, coffeed, or nourished. I mean, is there a verb to coffee? Yeah, maybe you've had your coffee or your, your nourishment. Thank you very much. And all those of you joining us online, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm hoping you ate in your own way, in your own time, at your own pleasure. But we had a very nice little lunch here um, at IFED headquarters. Right, so this is now going to be the feedback session um, following the earlier breakouts, the four breakouts, A, B, uh, C, D. And uh, I'm going to call up uh, two individuals who are going to be here and four who are going to join us uh, online. In fact, one, two, three, four, five online. I'm going to ask Mr. Ron Hartman, who's Director, Global Engagement, Partnership and Resource Mobilization from IFAD, to join us up on stage. And again, Dr. Stefanos Fortu, uh, Director of the Office of Sustainable Development Goals and Director of the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. And then joining us online are Dr. Namukolo Kovic, Director General's Representative to Ethiopia at ILRI. Madame Louise Aubin, or Aubin, a UN resident coordinator from Niger. So David Gressley, I think David Gressley is here or online? He's at David Gressley's online. Madame Sarah Sekinis, UN resident coordinator, coordinator at the Lao People's Democratic Republic. Madame Rosa Noda Videa. Representante Assistente Programas FAO Bolivia. I see you nodding with joy as I mangled up your name and title. Fantastic. Thank you. I feel the warmth and the pleasure. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do is we're going to be hearing back from each of the four groups, A, B, C, D. Each one of them is going to give the four or five key headlines, the key messages from their group. And remember, each group was getting, having an interaction with a different country or two, looking at national pathways. We're going to hear back uh, the four or so key headlines. And then after each one has spoken, I'm going to get a response from a couple of the six or seven colleagues that I've just introduced. Okay. So let's say A will speak, and then I might ask Ron and Stefanos to respond. And then B will speak, and I might ask uh, Dr. Kovic and uh, Madame Aubin to respond, and so it will go, okay? So we'll get a good dialogue going. And also, those of you tuning in online in your numbers, great to still have you with us. Please, if you feel that there is something, a takeaway, or something to do with national pathways that is missing, or you want to amplify or supplement, please feel free to do so, my colleagues will uh, consider it and pass it up to me um, in the honourable way. Okay, fantastic. So let's have a look. Who should go first? How about uh, panel A? So uh, breakout A, did you have a, um, a note taker? Now, I believe, Ron, you were the moderator, but hopefully you were not taking notes. Somebody else was <laughs> also. We do indeed. Was it, uh, I see Roberto is listed here. Is it, was it Roberto? Who was it? Our colleague here. Yeah. I, I, Deji, the private sector took notes. <laughs> not, not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with private sector taking notes. It's good. I, I'm, I'm very happy. Okay, so four or so key messages from um, your breakout group. Uh, which countries did you hear from, first of all? Uh, do you want to put your microphone on? Niger and um, Nepal. Niger and Nepal. Okay, so please hit us with the key messages. Yeah, thank you. Five, five, five major, you know, this, this is the summary of the summary. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> so first is there are no blueprints. So we have to have a dynamic strategy uh, that prioritizes local context. And we need to, you know, foster co-creation. So... There are no blueprints available. We have to be dynamic in our strategy and make that adaptable. Uh, second, following on that is don't scatter governments. Um, you know, local priorities, not donor priorities. How can you 
prioritize what is important in the local context of the food uh, uh, systems and charting that pathway to prosperity. Mm-hmm. Um, so this inclusiveness, um, how can you build solutions that includes the civil society, private sector, public sector, you know, be, be, be very, very inclusive, you know, putting uh, women, youth in the center of the design, uh, not just aftermaths, of, of implementation. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, fraud is, you know, what are the critical levers? We need to think knowledge, data, you know, data as a tool uh, for government actions and inactions, uh, uh, innovation, uh, uh, and then innovative finance as well. How do we unlock the capital uh, to make this all happen? Uh, uh, lastly, is the time is now. There's nothing we're waiting for. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, you've come in very on time and on budget, which is great. Um, how challenging was it for your group to focus down on just four or five key points? Because sometimes in these breakout sessions, it goes all over the place and it's very hard to define them. But this is, you're smiling at Ron there. I mean, <laughs> how, how, how was that? We had Ron. <laughs> he made it happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Ron, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, I think uh, we had a, a very rich discussion um, yep. and I think it was easy to, to summarise because there was a lot of alignment in terms of the issues that were, yep. that were brought forward, um, both from the colleagues that joined us online, but also the, the colleagues from the uh, Global Donor Platform membership. Uh, yep, fantastic. Okay, so let's uh, bounce some of those uh, key messages um, to our colleagues on the synthesis panel because this is what we're here to do. Uh, let's hear from uh, Madame Louise Aubin, the UN resident coordinator in Niger. So we're talking about a lack of blueprint. We need a blueprint. Um, real local content. Don't sideline governments. It's about local priorities, inclusiveness, and getting those critical levers. Y- your thoughts on that, Madame Aubin? I think that was a, well, we had a great moderator and a great participation. So it's a great summary of um, the key points that we had. And I probably... Um, observe there that, you know, we had um, a private sector uh, quite close to my country, so from Nigeria to Niger, meaning that the private sector was pretty pretty in tune with uh, what are those critical issues that, where the private sector could actually have added value. There's very concrete examples like um, uh, conservation and avoiding post-harvest uh, waste, uh, etc. And on the other hand, we also had around the table stakeholders who have a more regional um, uh, uh, function and were quite cognizant, I think, that the, the dynamics in the Sahel and the realities of Niger, from humanitarian through to um, highly security uh, context and the need for accelerated development. So it was a really um, quite cohesive conversation among uh, people who were able to hone in quite quickly on the issues. Mm-hmm. And, and what about that issue of local priorities and governments not being sidelined? Um, because I got the impression from my session, and we also talked about Niger, that the government's desire for support might be considered by some donors to be, um, I'm going to be politically incorrect, uh, dependent. And as a result, when they realize that a government may not have the capacity, as much capacity as other governments, they may consider them to be a recipient and not an equal partner. Um, is that something that you recognize? I, I would have no problem recognizing this and it's not uh, politically incorrect, it's probably uh, um, the reality when you're uh, working with a government that's um, always uh, touted as the poorest country in the world with um, very deep structural um, uh, issues preempting um, development and, and in particular in the food sector where there's chronic food shortages and chronic food insecurity compounded by insecurity. So, but I think our conversation um, was, I was able to bring forward, we also have very entrenched uh, well-tested institutions that actually do require some form of accompaniment and trust. There are governance issues that need to be strengthened. There is no question, but there's all, the backdrop is also a, a political effort to decentralize government and make government more uh, present in very remote areas. So you've got a combination of factors that actually 
should increase confidence. But again, there's an onus on the part of uh, donors to make sure that it was one of the points that was raised as as a a key uh, point from our conversation is that we also have to be disciplined. Donors, the UN, um, those who intervene on the ground with programs and projects, we need to be disciplined and more coherent. There are a few set of priorities that the government set forward. And if they are logical, good levers for change, that is where we need to focus and drop a little bit um, multiple offers uh, because they offer visibility to a donor, etc. We really have to stick to a game plan and the game plan does exist in, in Niger. Thank you very much, Madam Oban. And let me um, pivot over to David Gressley, your UN resident and humanitarian coordinator in Yemen. What, what do you think of those uh, four or five uh, messages that came from that initial session, talking about blueprints, local content, priorities, inclusiveness, and, and critical levers. And how much does that resonate, resonate with what you, what you see? Well, I think all of those are extremely important points, uh, particularly in a conflict uh, kind of situation. Inclusiveness uh, is often difficult to achieve, but extremely necessary for longer term stability. So I would highlight that in particular. Um, as I discussed in a breakout group that I was in, we, we face particular challenges here because the country is divided between a, a recognized government that controls about 25 territory that 25% of the people live in and a non-recognized authority for the balance, which is 70, 70% or so. Um, though those numbers are, are sometimes disputed. Um, So it it makes it uh, complicated in terms of how to deal with this. But I think what we're working on uh, here as donors, uh, UN, um, World Bank, uh, you know, the IFIs, pretty pretty good approach, I think, to look at how we can get the economy off its knees and back uh, to generate the income, reduce prices that make uh, and, and, and help resurrect food systems to make it more affordable for, for people uh, to, to take care of themselves instead of relying on humanitarian systems. So we've come a long distance in that regard, looking at it not only from a humanitarian assistance, not only from a development assistance either, uh, but also from a broader uh, economic approach, looking at the, the economic constraints imposed by the conflict to uh, unleash those constraints to let the economy thrive once again. And finally, of course, all of that fits into a larger political sphere uh, between the two parties, um, but also in in the region. So it's important to have an overall strategy in this kind of a context that is political and economic, as well as development and uh, uh, humanitarian in terms of response. So that would be a quick response from my side. Over. Great. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, David. Now let's hear what happened in breakout room. Let me see. B. Uh, I think moderator was Maurizio. And who was the rapporteur? Who is going to give us the key headlines from that session? And remember, we want you to amplify, to build on, to complement what was said, not say exactly the same thing. So only give, give me only new, fresh and interesting. Ah, Julie from DR Congo, the Office of the Presidency. Yes, yes. Indeed. I'm expecting great things from you. <laughs> okay, thank you for giving me the floor. Yes. Okay, not to repeat what was just uh, previously said. So what we can add is that um, the coordination of um, the action has been has improved over years. Uh, I know people are complaining about not enough coordination, but uh, still, uh, if we compare to 10 years ago, thanks to the GDPRD and also the older UNFSS dynamic, there is better coordination, uh, especially the summit has broken down the silos. So it has brought uh, the aspect of uh, working uh, systematically as on a systemic base, like with all the sectors and all the stakeholders as well. And uh, the improvement that is needed is to uh, identify the right actors for the implementation, especially the private sector, the SMEs or industry uh, that are not enough uh, represented at the discussion tables. So they should be more involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can also mention the knowledge product that are developed 
For instance, FAO CIRED EC50 Rapid Food System Assessment, and also the GIZ BMZ EC funded evidence based and costed country roadmaps in Ethiopia, Malawi, and Nigeria. And uh, one other thing, we, we mentioned alignment, and uh, like for instance, for Congo, I can mention uh, the National um, Investment Plan of Agriculture, where we need uh, help with um, the assessment and also the update to go more from agriculture to also uh, nutrition and uh, food security. Mm -hmm. So that's what can be added to the previous uh, elements. Fantastic. Well, um, you delivered. Thank you very much indeed. All right. And, and how easy was it to find consensus in your group? I mean, I see that Mauricio, well, with Mauricio driving the agenda forward, I'm sure that you aligned um, and you managed to bring things down to four or five quite quickly. How did it go? It was not uh, hard. It was easy. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was quite obvious. All right. We are sharing the same concerns, so it's easy to come to the uh, same conclusions. Excellent. Okay, well, let's um, hear what some of our synthesis panelists make of that. Let's go to Dr. Namukolo Kovic uh, at Ilri, Ethiopia. Dr. Kovic, hello to you. Um, you heard then from breakout room B, um, they were focusing on coordination, but it's better now than it was 10 years ago, which is great to hear. Bre silos are breaking down. Fantastic. Very, very important. The right actors are being identified. Are they being as involved as they need to be? Maybe not yet, but hopefully progress in there. But alignment, alignment, alignment. So they're the four I think I've picked up from you, Julie. Um, your thoughts, please, Dr. Yeah. Um, on my first, I think I want to start with the issue of alignment being critical. Um, and this is because food systems brings on board uh, multiple actors, um, each with their own vested interests in the food system. And so the idea of having a vision to the transformation pathway that can align all these multiple actors, I think would be uh, helpful. And that would also help in enhancing the coordination amongst the the stakeholders. So I think that visionary approach would help with the alignment. In terms of identifying the right actors, I think it's not so much identifying the right actors, but ensuring that the actors identify their unique entry points to contribute towards the transformation uh, process because different actors will actually have different entry points. They will have different things that they need to do. But whatever they do, it needs to be aligned to getting that vision that has been set for the transformation pathway, ensuring those linkages towards outcomes like nutrition and health, as well as sustainability uh, aspects. So when we look at the issue of having costed um, country roadmaps, there is also need to ensure that the different elements of the roadmap actually align towards delivering on the transformation uh, vision and that you minimize the trade-offs therein. And so those would be my, uh, my thoughts for now. And if that alignment um, is then uh, promoted, that helps to break further these silos and perhaps avoid even building new silos once the old ones have been broken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed for that, Dr. Kovic. Um, Ron Harman, what, what, what was your uh, response to the four key points, four key messages that came from breakout room B? You know, the coordination better than it was, but not perfect, of course, no, one, no, no one's doing it perfectly. Identifying right actors, but um, as Dr. Kobe said, it's about the right entry points, which is interesting, but alignment, alignment, alignment again. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, the, the symmetry between yep. all of the different groups and the discussions that we've been, been having. Um, in group A, um, Boris from, from GIZ um, sort of gave us a little bit of a back to the future thought, um, recounting you know, some of the commitments that were made by the international community in the past 
around harmonization and alignment. And mm -hmm. perhaps it's time to revisit and, uh, and rekindle and, and perhaps boost um, some of the commitments that have been made. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting for me in, in the early session this morning where we had the Rwandan minister speaking, yeah. um, where, she, where she focused around you know, donor priorities um, aligning to national priorities. Yes. And, and that, for me, sort of contextualizes a little bit where the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, it should be sort of national priorities yeah. driving what donors invest in, what donors should be focusing on. Um, and, and at the moment, it's a little bit perhaps in, in places the other way around. I mean, is it, and then this is, this is with reference to what I said about Niger, partly because the donor or the guys with the money, you know, and who feel that have the expertise, simply don't think that the recipient or partner government has the capacity, knows enough, is too unstable, and so therefore needs to be led. And that's been the practice thus far. And it continues, for all the words to the contrary, it continues to be the case in a significant number of partnerships. That's a, that's a factor, but it's hard to generalise in each context yeah. what, what's driving. Um, sometimes it'll be around making sure that the right kind of partnership frameworks are in place. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's around understanding the, the political economy and incentives. Um, other times it's around, you know, what kind of opportunities are, are there versus the, the capacity there is to implement. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a range of, of, of different, um, yeah. uh, different scenarios. Um, what was mentioned in, in Group 1 is, is not blueprint, as you said before, but no blueprint. Oh, sorry, no blueprint. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's really important because while there are similarities across food systems, across continents, across countries, every local context is very different. And therefore, a localised approach that's appropriate, yeah. um, that's inclusive, that's sustainable, um, is really important for food system transformation. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Ron. Okay. Okay, so break. let's go to breakout room... C, uh, Jim was a the moderator there, that's right. And uh, who did you identify as a rapporteur who's prepared, having listened to the two previous summaries and responses, to add something new, fresh, intriguing, challenging. I see a man looking at me and smiling nervously. This is good, this is good. Um, who is that? Gunther. Gunter, hello, Gunter. I once studied Gunter Grass, the blessed trommel, but that was a very long time ago. Remember the tin drum. Okay, so um, please hit us with four or five new thoughts, or if they're old thoughts, give them a fresh spin. Okay, I will bring you three observations and four kind of levers. So in terms of three observations that came out of the group, I think... One key observation was that follow up to the food system summit and to the transformation pathways is actually happening. They are not only existing on paper. When we go to Ethiopia, when we go to Nigeria, when we go to Yemen, something is happening there and we heard about it. And I will touch a bit on that later. The second point, second observation is from the group, I think that food systems thinking provides innovative framing. And we heard the word vision. It is really essential to have a vision. We reheard the word game changing. So there's something out there that brings something new. Uh, and I think this food systems approach, it brings together the aspects of people like food or health or income, planet like climate or biodiversity, prosperity, like win-win or trade-offs. Um, so there's something new in this approach and we need to embrace that newness of it. The third general observation is that context really matters. Mm. Uh, the three countries that we heard from are at different stages. Like Nigeria has already produced a wonderful brochure on pathways to food systems transformation and they're already thinking how to integrate the food systems thinking into their national plans. In Ethiopia, we heard about um, the plan to localize the coalitions on healthy diets on school feeding and so on. So something is happening there. It's different from Nigeria, but the, there's action on the ground. And it was particularly interesting also to hear from Yemen, how food systems transformation plays out 
in a conflict setting, when you have to think about insurance cost of food, or when you need to talk about import bills, when you don't have an economic base to, to buy your food. So very different issues in very different contexts. So these were the general observations. Now let me talk about four levers. Mm -hmm. One, I think that was heard so loudly was that national ownership is key. I think it has to really start with national ownership and that can also be multi-stakeholder ownership. It's not only government. Um, the second lever I think is around coordination and coordination is not only about donor coordination, it's also about national coordination. It's knowing where people have to go to when they want to do something about food systems. Where are the contact points? And there may be many. And it's a whole coordination system, I think, that has to be thought through and established and put to work. In terms of donor coordination, we also heard about interesting, innovative things that are happening. For example, uh, France reported about already at the level of the embassy, donors are uh, coordinating at that level. So um, there's different kind of coordination points also on, on the donor side that um, uh, could be further explored. I also want to just step back for a moment from the meeting itself and reflect on what actually happened in that room. We had people on the screen in different countries. We had people in the room sitting next to one another, talking in pairs. They were all there at the same time talking about a common topic I mean, it was a masterpiece of coordination. And I think we can learn a lot of lessons from those who have prepared this meeting to have actually this hybrid meeting, not as a kind of information flow from one end to the other, but real interaction. And that is about coordination. So I think even reflecting on the meeting provides a lot of insight. Next lever, third lever is around technical support and capability. And there, uh, I think what I heard there, it's not about technical support from global to local. It's really about co-design, about learning together how to do it. It's also thinking through that um, technical support means not only knowing about the substance. If you want to know about food systems, you need to be able to talk about biodiversity, about CO2, about calories in the food and so on. So it's really hard substantive knowledge that is required for that, but it's also process knowledge that, that, that we need for, uh, for technical support to make that work. And a really important point is that very often there are players that are not in the room. Those who disrupt the food system, the innovators, very often they come from the tech side, they come from the engineering side, they're not in the food systems community. And yet they have a huge bearing on what the future food systems will look like. So that's also something to consider. How do we bring these people into the conversation? And lastly, the level of finance. We talked a lot about repurposing, but we also said that repurposing is not enough. We also need additionality. So we need additional resources to implement a food systems approach. Wow, Gunther. Let me say that was a contribution worthy of your illustri illustrious literary predecessor, Gunter Grass. That was, that was really quite something. I was, you gave me a lot to think about there. I was just scribbling down again. I mean, you built, you built on what went before, which is uh, fantastic there. And um, I mean, I was just, you, you, you described quite um, concretely, actually. Uh, I, I put a cross by coordination points. Some people are using the embassy as a coordination point. Because I was thinking to myself, what are the right coordination points? Do people know where to go if they want to coordinate and align? Embassy. Yes, why not? Why not? Okay, let's uh, get the response of some of our, our colleagues uh, from the synthesis panel. I'm going to go to Madame Sarah Sekinis, who is the UN resident coordinator at the Lao Democratic uh, so People's Democratic Republic. Uh, Sarah, are you there? Where are you? Thank you. Yes, indeed. And yes, that's a mouthful hello. with a loud PDR. No, that, that's, no, no. Happy with the mouthful. So the coordination point was one of the many things Gunter said that jumped at me. What jumped out at you? 
Uh, thank you. I mean, after all of the, the speakers and, and Gunther going through so many points now, it's difficult to find points that have not been mentioned, but I'll elaborate a little bit on them. And on the coordination, and you mentioned the embassies, I actually would say that that's probably not where I would think that the coordination should take place. The coordination okay. needs to be done by the, the government itself. We can support, and I think that all of us have a role to do that, and, and the UN here, for example, uh, co-chairs with the government, the development coordination in the country. But I, I do think that that would be one of those ownership components that are really critical. Um, there's also a tendency, even those men, though many have mentioned the nutrition element, there's a tendency when we speak about food systems that we focus much more on the production system rather than the consumption system. And I think it's important then to realize that on the consumption side and on the production side, we have many different stakeholders and, and kind of unpack what we mean with stakeholders. In Laos, um, about 60% of the population lives in the countryside. 80% of the population is in some way, shape or form dependent on agriculture, but in different ways. So you have everything from subsistence uh, cultivation where they really rely on it for their sustenance and food to small holders that tend to access markets and have a little bit of business going on. They depend on it for their livelihood, even though that livelihood is, is fairly meager and they might uh, complement with other types of, of jobs. But then you also have the increased commercialization of the, uh, the agriculture sector here. Uh, and that here actually brings with it a risk because uh, some of this also, I think, because of uh, the, the land ownership structure in the country, which I think is similar to many countries where there hasn't necessarily been a land reform. It's state owned, uh, but states tend to uh, commission this out for uh, commercial uh, agriculture activities. And there we end up with a little bit of a problem because we have traditional um, uh, use of some of this land. And when vulnerable groups and indigenous groups suddenly lose the permission to, to uh, uh, use this land, we, we tend to forget that they're actually also a stakeholder in this. And, and we need to look at, at uh, the most vulnerable in terms of the commercialization of uh, agricultural activities and therefore look at the, the, the whole span of both producers and consumers, realizing that the, the consumption is everything from sustenance and nutrition to export goods that actually feeds the private sector, the, the um, national economy, and not least in a country, for example, like here, that's trying to, to uh, uh, really uh, prepare itself for, for graduating from the least developed uh, country um, classification, which really demands a lot of, of export when you have, uh, you know, that the only ways of um, rendering some uh, cash to move the rest of the system and the, and the engine of the economy around. So I think what I could add then was the land issue in terms of, of uh, being aware of how land reform needs to be part of this to uh, really cater for those most vulnerable looking at the diverse group of um, both those within the production cycle and on consumption on the consumption side and therefore really needing the disaggregate gate data to determine because the incentives for all of these various groups will be very very different depending on what group you belong whether you're an indigenous uh, high mountain uh, small scale uh, livelihood and sustenance farmer or whether you're a commercialized huge plantation style for export. These incentives are different. Uh, the, the voice is different. The places that at the table is different. Uh, and I think we can't do enough in terms of ensuring that disaggregation of data. So we know who we're talking about when we look at um, in improving and sustaining uh, food systems. I think I'll stop there. Oh, great. Thank, That's, you. thank you very much for that very um, worthwhile uh, contribution. When you talk about data, we'll be discussing data a little bit later on uh, this afternoon, optimizing the good quality data, uh, making it work for, for, for us. That, that, that's tremendous. And uh, yeah, remembering the, the diversity of actors and thinking about the consumer 
as well as, as, as the producer who we always have top of mind. Um, Stefanos, Dr. Foot to you. Um, I'm just wondering what jumped out at you there um, from session C. Um, your thoughts on that? Things. So I'm on the coordination, which um, we listen also from another session that it's going better. Yes. I think, and I've seen different coordination, I think they go better because they don't coordinate for coordination, but they coordinate for outputs. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part. Yeah. And that's a lesson we are learning to the, in the hub. So we try the coordination to be around specific outputs. The second thing is that it's something that wouldn't mention about the donors. And right now, the food system, financing food system transformations could be one of the most hot topics, uh, could be a topic that I will even say will survive the development money that they are taking out of the development accounts and they go to the humanitarian crisis without, mm -hmm. through the wall. But for this to happen, I think we need to respect and my, my kind pledge and wish to the donors is look at what the countries have already done and don't try to prioritize again. Mm -hmm. We sometimes we go in an endless cycle of prioritization while the priorities are still there. So at least for the countries that they had good pathways and they have done this through a multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral process, we know what needs to be financed. And in addition to prioritization, I think that um, a very big part of, of support is not the money that they will go through technical support to the donors to the countries, but the money could be leveraged uh, by the financial institutions. I'm looking at IFAD here, not only IFAD, the, the regional banks, the World Bank, all the, all the global funds. We, we need to make them um, relevant to the food system transformations. And let me say that the last point for me would be that um, we, we all know that we need to focus at the country level. And right now, we might have a risk of losing the momentum because of the war. Uh, yeah. in Ukraine. And we don't need to lose this momentum. And it really gets a small amount of resources relatively to keep the momentum. I, I've discussed with some countries and they do want to keep the small teams they have already put there. They want to keep a couple of people that they were pivotal on doing this transformation. So this is something we need to, to, to keep focusing. And that's something that the Hub would like very much to talk with the donor community about. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much indeed for that, Stefanos. Okay, good. Uh, let me see. Perhaps now we can go to breakout room D, which was held here, the Italian room, and I was moderating, and we had um, two online participants, one from Niger and one from Colombia, and I believe Peter, Peter Vobbs, what do you say? Yes, over there. Thank you. So let me, uh, I think there will be more symmetries as it has been uh, mentioned before, but I will try to emphasize and to, to complement. Uh, you just mentioned the two countries we heard from, Niger, yes. Niger as well as uh, the first group uh, and uh, Colombia. Uh, we haven't tried to recap the dimensions of the pathways like coordination, tech support, but really try to concentrate on the drivers mm -hmm. to address existing and persisting uh, challenges. And for us, the first uh, and foremost important uh, driver to make this really a national inclusive uh, process is that you need multi-stakeholder consultation and, uh, and processes. So really listening to the people on the ground, small-scale farmers in particular, but also youth, civil society by and large, including, including at community level, because that's where the implementation finally is happening. But also involving the private sector from the onset is absolutely key. And for us, that was a, a fundamental thing. Also, where maybe uh, those countries who are not there yet can learn from those who have undergone uh, these, these processes. A little bit linked to this, we had a, compar a comparison 
uh, with the, the big uh, theme of climate change. If you go out and actually yes. grab anybody on the on the street and you would ask him uh, about his or her opinion on climate change, everybody would immediately know what you're talking about. Yeah. If you would talk about uh, agri-food systems, people or 95% of people would probably stare at you and have no clue uh, what this is actually about. So we need to get out there into the societies uh, and make this more known. So really bringing out the importance of the, of the topic to the stakeholders, but also the final sort of recipients. In the end, this is all about uh, food, uh, food intake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, consumers, uh, et, cetera, et cetera. So outreach, mainstream this as a topic within uh, a societal uh, context. And uh, for those who then want to engage in this, make um, food systems look like an exciting opportunity yeah. and not like an economic uh, fallback position. So that was the first uh, complex, let's say, in terms of, of drivers. The second one is also, again, multi-stakeholder, but more from a multi-political thematic uh, angle. So really a, a multi-thematic approach, uh, working towards policy coherence and linking uh, to all necessary policy policy areas. And there is a little bit of a danger to be too broad and mm -hmm. to try to address this all simultaneously at the same time. Uh, but you need to be also broad uh, in order to bring the food systems context into a broader economic transformation uh, process and make it very clear to everybody that this is really key. And if this is not happening, then broader economic development is probably not happening as well and one one uh, example here was really the whole issue of health it's not only about healthy diets let's say that you would directly associate with agri-food systems or food systems by and large uh, but also uh, healthcare systems right and the sustainability mm -hmm. of healthcare systems within this context so that was a very impressive actually coalition uh, in Colombia of ministries and other institutions that were actually participating in this overall process. Mm -hmm. And the third one is uh, straightforward, m and &E and accountability, if you want to call it that. So really concrete indicators that are being monitored, a monitoring system that also would allow for timely adjustment of the operationalization and the implementation of the national pathways. If you don't really look at what you're doing, if you don't sit back, analyze it, if you don't uh, um, draw the lessons uh, to be learned from the process, then you probably get stuck at some point. And if you want to really bring this uh, forward in a meaningful manner, then you have to uh, spend the effort. And the fourth one is uh, something that I guess all the groups have mentioned, uh, but I re-emphasize it, uh, is the funding, right? And funding yeah. uh, is essential. Money makes the world go round uh, from the private side, but also from the, from the public side. In innovative funding approaches, rapid funding mechanisms, uh, was mentioned, catalytic funding, uh, matching grants, uh, challenge funds, uh, integrated uh, financing, and so on and so forth. And I guess that is the biggest challenge and the biggest driver of the full-scale um, operationalization of the national pathways, because without, and that was mentioned as well, additional uh, resources and efforts, uh, probably this is not going to happen uh, at the scale necessary. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Peter. Let's see. Um, I think we should go to Madame Rose Nova Videa, uh, who's at FAO in Bolivia, represent... Uh, my Spanish is terrible, but uh, Asistente Programas. <laughs> You're smiling with sympathy at my appalling Spanish. That's fine. That's fine. But uh, yes, I mean, the, one of the things that jumped out at me and I was in that session was, yes, it's true. A few years ago, um, the term climate change, most people didn't really have a concept. They were sort of broadly aware of it. Now, almost everybody has got an opinion and very few people deny that something is happening. And children went around on, on strike around the world and every, every government somewhere has to engage and meaningfully now, if only to say something at COP, <laughs> but, but usually for more than that. Um, but then, as we said in our group, um, you mentioned, you know, food systems, uh, transformation and pathways and people wouldn't understand, even though they themselves are highly affected by it in all countries uh, around the world. 
please, what uh, struck you? What would you like to, how would you respond to what you heard? Well, I, I think that we all agree that transforming food systems is a challenging opportunity for us as donors, as UN agencies to work all together in a coordinated manner. You know that in Bolivia, we have a lot of uh, adverse events that uh, re is really challenging for us to, to deal with this and to deal with all this crisis that we are supporting. So I think that it's really important to provide coordinated support to the countries. And it is necessary to support countries uh, to have defined a country strategy, but a clear one. I think this, we are, we are all talking about how this strategy must be multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, participatory, holistic and integrated country strategies. So, uh, but I, I really want to, to mention, and I really want to highlight that uh, it is really necessary to, to consider this uh, national strategy in a, with a regional approach, with a global one, which houses the country in a regional context. All the United Nations agencies and all the donors, we have offices in most of the countries, and this allow us to provide support to the countries in strategic terms. And I, I really think that's important. Uh, our countries need that, this strategic view of how to deal with this term transformation of our food, uh, uh, food systems. So I think it's uh, important to understand the needs of each country, but integrating it into the regional vision. This would constitute a real support for the transformation of food systems in the longer term. And I think it's really naive to think that each country come out of this crisis, of this climate change crisis and uh, 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 in isolation way. It, it is naive to think that each country can transform its food systems in, in isolation, you know. So I think a vision of complementarity, synergy, and learning between countries is, is really needed. So I think this, this event is, is absolutely necessary and useful for all countries of, uh, in, in the world to, to see to, to how countries are dealing with this uh, challenge. You know, in Bolivia, we established a roadmap that offers multiple areas of focus to support national transformation pathways, including national innovation, ecosystems, societal and institutional innovations, knowledge and technological innovation, innovation also. And somebody was talking also about data and data and digital solutions. But also we recognize the importance to improve global food systems and how countries will need to lead national multi-stakeholder transformations. But, and this is important, while cooperating at regional and global levels. And our region, especially at, uh, with, with the support of FAO, we are at working in this regional strategy. So I think uh, that was important to mention, promoting national food system transformation requires this regional innovation ecosystems by creating inclusive national innovation strategies that are adequately supported, committed, and of course, to, uh, to be sourced, resourced. Um, well, uh, finally, I think that we are talking about innovation and innovation is key action in this process. So, um, we can speed up food system transformation and accelerate progress towards achieving the SDGs by transforming food systems and taking a broad view of innovation. And it, this includes um, a main aspect, how we collaborate and work with different stakeholders as today, including the most vulnerable as Bolivia. <laughs> and innovation must a feature inclusive and participatory decision-making involving a diverse set of stakeholders by um, be the small scale producers, women, job, indigenous people. So I think it's, it's in, it really uh, necessary to have all these actors in this process, but in to be able to engage them in an equitable manner that will enable this greater success in creating ro a robust and sustainable food system transformation in our countries. Thank you very much indeed, and, and delivered with a lot of energy. I like that too, uh, Madam Rosin Nova Videa. Uh, so representing FAO in 
uh, Bolivia, uh, the programming there. I'm just wondering, before I get, I've got a question that's coming here, and let me say to all our friends and colleagues who are tuning in, is, is that of 49 of you? That's good. Participants, so the numbers stay steady. Pleased about that, good. Um, if you have questions, and you can still get them in during this session, we've got another 20 or so minutes uh, left of this session, please fire them in now, you know, make them tight and, and relevant, and we'll try and get them to our uh, panellists. Uh, before I get to this question from James Mwanda in Uganda. I'm just wondering if our, any of our other synthesis panel members feel that we must, we should emphasize the regional nature of the pathways as well as the uh, national, because we've been talking a lot about national, local ownership, national, national, but uh, Madame Nova Videa has been saying, think about regional because that's how she's thinking. Anybody want to say anything about that? Just raise your hand if you're not. Ah, okay, fantastic. Okay, so Sarah Sekenes, yes, you want to say something about that? Yes, uh, indeed. I think it's absolutely correct to think of it from a regional perspective. Uh, I'm sitting in a landlocked country that is nothing without its uh, regional uh, context, and, and it's really trying to integrate. Uh, and there's lots going on in the ASEAN group here, and I'm sure that, that actually is, is relevant in all regional contexts. And, and it will be critical for, for Laos to, to be put into the context of trade and export, uh, but also being heavily dependent on import, obviously connecting to the, the food systems in neighboring countries. And if I can take the opportunity to just mention one thing that uh, perhaps links also to um, some of the, the, the impatience that you mentioned from donors um, uh, in terms of, of uh, saying that, why is it not happening and, and how come it doesn't uh, you know, materialize? We've been waiting for so long. I think yeah. one of the critical points that is very much emphasized in the humanitarian development nexus, and even though this is not a humanitarian context, it's equally valid. It's the multi-year funding structure because most Funding actually comes in, in uh, annual disbursements and annual agreements, which of course brings with it some impatience. You want results of, of your investment in a year, but when you look at transforming food systems, you're actually talking about a, a multi-annual process that will require some patience in terms of the transformation element. Otherwise we will just replicate year from year what we've been yeah. doing for many years. So multi-year funding would be an additional thing and a signal to, to the donor group. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Well, let me say, Sarah, I think you must have been talking to James Mwanda in Uganda because here's his question. Um, governments, he says, from the developing world usually request funding for projects. However, more often than not, the financing either comes in late or not the total amount requested. And in most cases, this problem causes the failure of these projects as the asking government has to readjust the budget and objectives, denting the overall goals of the funding and the projects. Particularly when it comes to climate change, projects aimed at uh, fighting climate change will be seriously affected, thus increasing vulnerability and exposure. What do the panelists comment on this pertinent issue? So Sarah, we've heard what you've got to say. I'm just looking to see who I could go to next. David Gressley, any thoughts on that? Uh, James being very concerned about the nature of funding for projects, and often it comes in late or not the total amount, and as a result, the overall goals are not achieved. And then he's obviously thinking about it in a, well, he's mentioned climate change, but of course, we're thinking about pathways and food systems and implementing the goals. Well, I, I, I would fully agree with the, the point that's being made, and even the earlier point on the regional approach as well. Um, but without a multi-year approach and, and some level of a guarantee of consistent funding, it's difficult to, to change systems um, uh, with the consistency that's required. So uh, I would fully agree with that, that point. Uh, but our funding mechanisms typically are not designed for that. Um, it's usually a patchwork of things put together that try to achieve as much as possible. Uh, but, and, and then with lack of consistency, I'm thinking from a donor point of view, uh, lack of consistency on, on leadership of that support. 
Uh, there's, there's often rapid turnover uh, of personnel and so forth. It does not lead to consistency either in working with partners, whether they're in the government or, or in the country itself. And I think that's a weakness in our system of donor support. And one where you, when you are working on systems that you need to take, a, I think, a longer term view, uh, both in terms of funding, but in terms of individual commitment to be supporting that all the way through. If not, you, you end up with different uh, views. Everybody thinks whoever they replaced didn't do as good a job as they're doing and they change things. And that's confusing when you get uh, conflicting support, conflicting advice. So uh, I would throw in the consistency, uh, uh, not only of funding, but of, uh, of the support and nature of that support. Over. Thank you very much, David Gressley. Uh, now, Dr. Namukolo Kovic at the Ilri in Ethiopia, please, your thoughts. Yeah, um, my thoughts on uh, both issues, on the regional uh, perspectives, uh, definitely. Um, particularly for the African continent, I think Agnes already alluded to the CADEP framework that we already have. And the CADEP framework uh, has a CADEP biannual review process that is uh, taking place. But there's already discussions um, in the African Union about putting a food systems lens on the CADEP process. Um, the Africa Common Position on the UN Food Systems Summit has already done that. And there are currently discussions on adding food systems indicators in the CADEP biennial review process. So having these regional frameworks where multiple countries have already uh, agreed to implementing really can catalyze things uh, on the continent. Um, and then with the issue of uh, budgets and funding that is not consistent, I fully agree with uh, what David and the others have said about the need for that consistency. But I also think it points to another angle. And it is the angle of really ensuring that the investments that take place are catalytic in nature, as opposed to uh, being the end and all of Mm -hmm. Now we can't do anything anymore. So I think there is need for donors to really think in terms of investments being catalytic such that we create both pull and push factors from the policy uh, perspective and from the demand perspective so that the transformation can be begin to propel and build the momentum on its own. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Kovic, actually, you know, people have um, been using this term catalytic quite a bit today and in other sessions. And I would love it if somebody could give me an example of an investment that they've been responsible for or witness being catalytic, what it catalyzed, how transformative it was, because, you know, we've got probably abstract ideas in our minds of what catalytic investment might look like as opposed to ordinary regular investment traditional investment but um it would be great to have an example of a catholic catholic investment that helped to transform in a food systems context because i, I think that would be really interesting and exciting to to hear because uh, dr Kovic, yes i i agree catalytic yes but i i want to feel this you know, we know what a catalytic converter does in a car. Okay, what about catalytic when it comes to investments in a food systems, uh, you know, pathway or transformation? Um, I'm looking at everybody to see if somebody's eyes are lighting with fire and who has got a vision of something. We talked about vision earlier. Gunther, yes? You, you've, got a, you've got an idea of, yes? Give me, you could give me an example of some kind of, catalytic investment in a food systems context? Filash nine or? No, I'm not gonna leave you hanging, don't worry. Ah, before you do run, I think Gunter's coming through. Okay, I think in terms of visionary, I think what's really important is to, to think through where do you want to go with the food system? What does it look like? Yes. 
Okay, and there are so many dimensions that we can consider. For example, a very simple dimension is crop livestock balance. It's a very, it would change, uh, introducing a principle of uh, crop livestock balance would change the production system in so many places, yes. but it's not there. So it is a catalytic intervention just to think about key principles that would transform the food system. Or another catalytic uh, intervention could be an innovation. If you get your protein from a bioreactor and you say, I don't produce any more protein on my fields, it will change around completely the food system. So thinking about an innovation that is disruptive, yeah. it may be not only catalytic, it may be fundamentally transformative. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gunter. So Ron, okay, let's go. Um, well, I was going to say something similar. Um, you know, the, the, what's catalytic is dependent upon what the, the terms of the investment is and, yes. and the context itself. So it might be scale, it might be innovation, um, there could also be some other outcomes. Um, for us, uh, in terms of the Food System Summit, uh, there were some of the coalitions that were discussed during the summit that I feel were, were very catalytic. The work that um, WFP has pioneered with FAO and EFAD around school feeding um, mm -hmm. has been catalytic in a, in a lot of places. Right. Some of the work that, um, that EFAD has done with Indigenous peoples um, has been very catalytic in, in terms of their inclusion, improving nutrition and food security outcomes. Um, work that's happened on, on rural finance um, across the African continent, but also elsewhere has been catalytic in mm -hmm. providing access to finance, et cetera. So it really depends on, on the context. Yes. A lot of the, the catalytic impact that us as financiers often look at is scale. You know, how can we can we take a, a small innovation that's tested somewhere um, and then make sure that that innovation benefits the maximum amount of, of people possible? And that's really important in terms yes. of the, the food security challenges that we face as a global community at the moment. Tremendous. Thank you very much for that. That's really, really good. Um, and I'm just thinking, I mean, we, you know, we've got about another seven or eight minutes left. I'm just wondering, Stefanos, what you're thinking all of this means for the UN Coordination Hub. Because as I said this morning, uh, when we met, you tweeted happily on the 16th of May that we're up and running and we're ready for business. And you've ampl amplified that to some degree here today. But having heard all of this over the last hour and being part of the synthesis panel, how do you absorb what you're getting here and feed it into uh, the coordination hub as a catalyst or what do you do? I think, I mean, <clears throat> the first time I, I heard myself, the word catalyst was in chemistry lessons. Yes, I remember that as well. And, and catalyst there was something like an accelerator yes. or an enabler. So you're using a catalyst either to accelerate the process or to make or to enable the process. And catalyst could be an enzyme, for example, that it will make something happen. Yes. So what I see from the discussion today and from other discussion I've participated the last month is that there are elements of food system solutions out there in what we vaguely call the food system summit ecosystem of support. Mm -hmm. There are elements of the solutions. Nobody has the perfect recipe on what a food system transformation means and how it can be done. And I think that this is the most challenging answer. The one question that they are from the conveners, which I will repeat, they do say, you convinced us is about food systems, it's not about agriculture. Now tell us how we can make it at the, at the field level. Mm -hmm. So there are elements of the solutions and no one of us will have the absolute solution. Mm -hmm. But I think we all have to contribute. I will agree that there's not one recipe to fit all. I want to challenge a little bit the idea that we don't have a blueprint at least in the UN system, the 2030 agenda and the SDGs is a blueprint. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't want to call it a blueprint, call it a beacon, because this is where we need to, to target. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I see as the catal catalytic uh, work of the hub is to bring these solutions together, mm -hmm. put them in a context of an open access um, set to the national governments, to the conveners, and then work with the national stakeholders, the agencies at the national level, the offices of FAO, of IFAD, of WFP in the countries, 
and offer to the countries this portfolio, and then the countries will select. Mm -hmm. um, the day, not the day before yesterday, yesterday, the hub had a three hours workshop with the coalitions of support. And we tried to identify some of the things that we could do together. And at the end of the workshop, and a couple of people here, Gunne was there also, there was a proposal to the hub, which was saying, you know, there are 30, 27 or 30 coalitions out there. You need to select only a few of them to work. And I say, no. The hub is going to offer the platform of cooperation to everybody. It's the market that it will clear the coalitions and the solution providers. If the coalitions, the science, the stakeholders, they have something to offer to the conveners, this added value will be recognized, will be identified, and I think the countries will use it. A catalyst usually needs a fluid in which it operates. Usually mm -hmm. it's a fluid. I don't know why, but you know, all the enzymes need to be in a fluid situation. And this fluid really is- really smiling as we're getting some chemistry here. And, 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 this and, this, good. and this fluid is some of the catalytic resources we will need to mobilize in the next 18 months to two years before we make sure that the entire body of the food systems follow up, which should be the big funds, the big banks, the private banks, the private sector is ready to not only take the catalyst, but do the big business. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Stefanos. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. So we're coming towards the end of this session. I'm just thinking about our virtual panelists, and uh, I uh, think one or two of you haven't spoken as uh, perhaps much as uh, you could have done. So I'm thinking, so who, uh, Louise has gone slightly incognito there for a second indeed. Oh, she's back, <laughs> smiling. Um, a couple of closing thoughts. I mean, what are the one or two greatest actions or actions that would make the greatest difference for the national pathways and food systems? Do you have, you know, one or two thoughts about an action or two that would make the greatest difference for the national pathways at this point now where we are? Do, do you have any thoughts on that, Louise, as we come to the close of this particular session? Because we've already heard from Stefanos, he's energized, He's got his fluid ready, you know, the catalyst. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. So he's got the catalyst, but we need the fluid, the viscous fluid that will harbor this enzyme. But, but we know what we're talking about. We are ready. What, what do you think, Louise? Can you, can you add something to this catalyst so that when the fluid comes, it's going to go pow? I don't know about this. <laughs> I don't know about this viscous fluid, but I, I'm just going <laughs> to. I'm going to stick to um, uh, what is it that I know. I think um, for those, for, for everyone who's emphasized uh, the need to focus on tailoring um, food system support to the national level, I think alignment with national policies, national institutions, and uh, capacity building there and having right governance structures or uh, governance models that. Um, increased confidence for investment, etc. All of that package, I think, is extremely important, very relevant to Niger. We might be talking about the poorest country in the world, the one surrounded by terrorism um, uh, 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 with a food, and a very severe food crisis with indicators that we haven't seen in 10 years. Uh, nonetheless, it does have some pillars that we do need to invest in and not reinvent the wheel in as much as we do need innovation, technology, et cetera, but we need to create that investment confidence. And I think that starts with, you know, the, the government plans, leadership and institutions. The other aspect that maybe um, hasn't been put forward uh, in those terms is the all of society approach. Um, there was emphasis on, you know, recognizing a regional approach. And of course you can't dissociate Niger from the Sahel this is for the same reasons that, uh, my colleague from Lao said, you know, just in terms of enclavement and uh, geography, climate, uh, but also trading um, networks, etc. But I would have, I, I would not want to be absorbed in processes 
but steer away from the tailored approach required for the, for the country. So the All of Society approach does ensure that re-emphasizing the role of um, women's groups, women's farmers, uh, the very necessary work to um, job creation aspect to um, um, channel youth, a, a hugely growing youth cohort that really need to be channeled. And I think the food systems um, approach is really a, an opportunity there for, for Niger. So just a couple of thoughts on top of yep. the very needed nexus with um, urgency, humanitarian response and, and development funding. Thank you very much indeed, Louise Oban, UN resident coordinator in Niger. I like this all of society uh, approach that you meant. A br brief word in, in, in closing before we, I'm going to pivot back to you, Ron, uh, to help us round off the session. Uh, but Madame Rossi Nova Videa, um, quick thought from you on an action that would make the greatest difference for the national pathways and food systems at the country level. I mean, Louise says all of society approach. What do you say? I, I want to share with you something that we have created or maybe analysis, uh, make an analysis in Bolivia. And th this is about a solution that we found because this problem this issue is really uh, challenging. So how can we um, avoid all, all these this issues and also to, to face this in an assertive manner? Uh, so through this process, Bolivia has achieved an important milestone and that is in order to achieve this transformation of food systems. And we decided to carry out differentiated strategies. And I really believe that this would apply to all countries as an, as an innovative contribution to the process. We have recognized the existence of three food systems, the indigenous one, the agrobusiness food system, and a food, a food system called agroecological or differentiated quality or in transition. So this allow us to address the transformation in a differentiated way. And I think this is important. So we can make this tailored, you know, and with differentiated strategy, strategies and actions and public policies. And that's the way we are working this in Bolivia because it was a broad uh, approach. So we decided to go into three main uh, food systems. So we recognize that not one, we recognize three of them. So uh, in, th in this way, we, we think, we really think that we can obtain greater success in the process, greater, greater ownership, and therefore a response and a change in a longer term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Rosa. Noda Video, thank you very much to our panelists. That was the synthesis panel. And I think we need, Ron, then in a way, very briefly, to, to synthesize, synthesize what we've just heard, if, if you would be, we'd be so bold, because we've, we've had a, a range of responses from the four uh, feedback um, rapporteurs. And then, of course, our colleagues on the panel have amplified those. I'm just wondering what our concluding thoughts will be before we break and we're going to go into data. That's another very, very important one in about 15 or so minutes time. But what, is, what is your abiding thought as you synthesize what, we, what we've heard in the last hour or so? Yeah. What's really apparent to me is it's been terrific to, to hear from the resident coordinators, um, the representative from Ildari and, and also FAO. I'm just bringing in that uh, that context um, from the countries themselves, that reality um, of, of what types of support are needed. I, I guess um, my reflections while I've been listening to the discussions build on what Stefanos said in the opening session, yeah. built on a little bit now, about the need to um, deconceptualize food systems. Yeah. Um, and what was really interesting in, in the, the, the working group discussion we had was the, the Nepali representative spoke about what kind of support is required by the government of Nepal? And he was talking about knowledge. Um, he was talking about um, monitoring evaluation, talking about finance, et cetera. Um, and for, for us um, from, from donors and, and development partners, one, one of the key aspects that, that we need to try to respond to is not so much our, our own objectives, but the demand for support and appropriate support at the country level. Mm -hmm. What we're hearing from, from many of our member states is, um, is they, they need help in, in, in dealing with 
some of the challenges that are immediate at the moment related to some of the structural issues in food systems. Um, and, and a big issue facing uh, our, our member states at the moment is around the policy trade-offs that they face with food systems. Mm. Um, last month at the um, World Bank IMF meetings, we had the, the Minister of Indonesia, um, uh, uh, Minister of Finance from Indonesia, participate in a, in a, in a, a side event with our president. And she was talking about some, um, some trade restrictions that Indonesia recently um, had imposed on, on cooking oils. And it relates to um, what Johannes was saying in the, in the earlier session before about the lessons learned from 2008 seem to be repeating themselves mm. a, a little bit now. But she was describing, you know, what, what for her as a minister does she need to do? Um, she's worried about local food security. She's worried about, of course, the political context in country but she, they know also the effect of, of restrictions on international trade prices, mm -hmm. et cetera. So for us as a, a development community, how we can provide support in the right kind of way, whether it's knowledge, innovation, technical <laughs> financing, to help um, uh, countries that don't have the capacity at this stage to think through what kind of policy frameworks need to be in place, mm -hmm. what kind of support needs to be in place, and what kind of coordination can be leveraged from development partners to support um, this policy framework, so I think, is is a really critical way forward. Tremendous. That's my thoughts. No, no, that's, that's great closing thoughts. Thank you very much. Papo, put your hands together to our panel, please. Rod Hartman, Stefanos Fitu, Namukolo. Keep it going, Namukolo Kovic, Luis Oban. Come on, more energy. Come on, come on. You're about to get a break. David Gressley, <laughs> Sarah Sekines, and Rosa Noda Videa. So when we come back after 15 minutes, and I think we have a coffees and teas, your final bit for the final push. I'm, I'm into athletics track and field. And so before, so if you're trying to break the mile world record, the hardest lap is the third lap because you want to die. But if you can just keep, stay in touch with the leaders when they ring the bell, da -da 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 -da, then you might be in touching distance and you may somehow from somewhere find that very famous finishing kick and then get there. Maybe not break the world record, but at least be in touch. So that's where we are now. We're at the start of that third lap, nearly there. Fantastic. So please take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to eat, sleep and drink data. Fantastic. Okay, see you shortly, 15 minutes. <laughs>